Hello. Can you hear me, Ted? Yes, I can, Robo. I'm here. All right, excellent. Okay. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, we're just getting the space started. Uh, this space is entitled Roadmap for Sustainable Peace and Accountability in Ethiopia. Uh, so we're just going to wait as our uh, co-hosts and other speakers join us. It's just going to take a few minutes. In the meantime, please share the space and we'll get started uh, momentarily. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, the presence of a very special um, individual. Hello, uh, Special Envoy uh, Mike Hammer. Uh, it's an honor to have you here, sir. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, we invite everyone to continue to share the link and uh, we'll get started uh, shortly. Thank you. To those of you who are just joining us, uh, this space will be recorded. So uh, if you know people or friends who uh, couldn't attend, they can still listen to the recording uh, through the link. Uh, but we're just waiting for our other speakers to join us. Uh, we're gonna have a very interesting discussion for you today uh, entitled Roadmap for Sustainable Peace and Accountability in Ethiopia. Uh, so far it's uh, just Ted and myself, but uh, we just await a few other people uh, but we'll get started shortly. In the meantime, just please continue to circulate the link. Uh, invite your friends uh, to listen to this very special discussion. Thank you. Ambassador Hanner, uh, Hammer, this is Ted Turfe. I just want to thank you for joining us today and um, uh, looking forward to uh, uh, connecting again and, um, uh, you know, getting a briefing from you on your recent trip to Ethiopia. But thank you for joining us. Hi, uh, are you able to hear us? Can we do a, a mic check and equipment check? Yes. Excellent. So we're just waiting for a few people. Uh, we're just waiting for um, Sen Knight and uh, Dr. Fitzum. That's Dr. Sen Knight and Dr. Fitzum. Uh, and then we can get started. Uh, to those of you who are just joining us, we have a very special space for you today in which we'll discuss the Roadmap for Sustainable Peace and Accountability in Ethiopia. Uh, of course, this is from the Amhara lens or perspective, but uh, we trust that uh, everyone can take something interesting away from this. Uh, this space will be recorded. So if you're unable to attend and you wanna to listen to the rest of it, or if you have friends who cannot attend for whatever reason, they can uh, access the space uh, at a later time through this link. And I see uh, Dr. Sennight is with us, so I'm just going to invite her up. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Sennight, um, uh, please uh, invite the, or sorry, accept the invitation to come up and uh, I think if uh, Dr. Fitzgum just needs a few more minutes, uh, or if he's if this is not convenient for him, we can we can get started and he can join us. Thank you very much. Please let uh, us know. Thank you very much, Robel. Uh, yeah, I I am. I, I don't know. Can you hear me? I accepted. Yes. Okay. 
Perfect. Yeah, um, I think in the interest of time, uh, we can. It would be good if we could just start with introductions, and he will be joining joining us. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, excellent. So as soon as he joins, he can just uh, send a request to speak, and uh, we'll let him up. Uh, but I think uh, we can get started. Uh, we have lots of familiar faces, but uh, I think we're going to be touching on some interesting topics. Uh, so as I said before, um, this title, the, this, the title of the space is going to be Roadmap for Sustainable Peace and Accountability in Ethiopia. So as its name suggests, this is going to be talking about some of the very key and pertinent issues that are happening right now, including the ongoing nego so-called negotiations or peace talks, uh, which have been a very uh, contentious topic in the Amhara community, as all of you know, because of the uh, feeling that Amharas have been excluded from these talks. And then in addition to that, there's going to be uh, uh, really a delve into accountability, especially with the ICHREE or the Commission's recent interim report and efforts that have been uh, undertaken by the international community to bring accountability for atrocities committed in the context of this war in Northern Ethiopia, as well as in other parts of the country. So we're gonna begin with introductions, uh, starting from uh, maybe uh, Tedros. Uh, Ted, if, you, if you're able to speak, just an introduction about yourself and uh, about uh, maybe AAA and other uh, affiliations. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Rob, I appreciate it. Um, everyone, welcome and thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Teodros Terfe, and I serve as chairman of the Amhara Association of America, uh, also known as AAA. Uh, AAA is an advocacy group that was established in 2016 to organize Amharas globally, including in Ethiopia, and advocate for the Amhara people by directly engaging with the U.S. government, international institutions such as the U.N. and African Union, human rights organizations, and Western media, um, you know, our advocacy is evidence-based, founded on the investigation, documentation, and reporting that's conducted by our human rights investigators who are on the ground in Ethiopia. And if you're not familiar with our reporting, I invite you to visit our website and read our reports. Um, in addition, AAA uh, works very closely with Amara uh, organizations across the globe to provide humanitarian aid to Amaras in Ethiopia. Uh, through the establishment of Bakan Amara Emergency Fund, uh, 20 Amara organizations came together and raised nearly $2 million since the TPLF invaded the Amara region. And we have provided uh, free meals to uh, over 130,000 IDPs, free medical services, uh, provided free medicine to hospitals, uh, free psychotherapy training, and seed money to start small businesses for um, nearly 1,000 Amara women who were raped by the TPLF militias. Please visit our website. Um, if you have any questions or ideas, email us. You know, or send us a DM through our social media. And uh, really looking forward to having this discussion today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Ted. Uh, next, uh, Hona, if you can introduce yourself and um, uh, your role at AAA. Thanks, Robert. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, let me just say that. I'm Honey, we can't hear you very well. We can't hear you very well. Oh, uh, how about now? Uh, I, I think there's a little bit of uh, echo and background on it. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Sennight, please uh, uh, introduce yourself and uh, your affiliations. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sanai Tadaraja Sanai. I'm a, a biosecurity researcher, uh, but uh, uh, today I'm here on my capacity as a director of genocide prevention in Ethiopia, but generally really commenting on, uh, you know, uh, on the way forward from uh, the multidimensional problems we're facing as Ethiopians, and also very specifically as ethnic Amaras who've been targeted both um, through war crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and uh, a very extremely uh, coordinated um, cover up. And so, so, so my angle, like the angle I want to look at is how um, easy it would be or how, um, uh, possible or it would be to, to move on into a, into a sustainable peace and accountability in Ethiopia when a, a bigger portion of the, the, the population 
uh, is being completely ignored um, or uh, you know, crimes against um, them uh, covered up. Um, as uh, at, at GPE, just to say a couple of things, uh, we're focused on uh, evidence and documentation of these crimes that have been for far too long um, hidden and ignored and deliberately uh, in a coordinated manner covered up. And sometimes even the, the crimes are being uh, blamed on the victims themselves. Um, we have also a legal and filing department, although our primary plan at the moment, since this is an ongoing genocide, is exposing the genocide and stopping it, building awareness. Uh, but wherever possible that we will try and get uh, build a case against perpetrators of this cause. Um, Uh, is it just me or has Sen Knight's uh, audio cut off? No, it cut off, Wabel. Uh, uh, we lost her. For May. Hopefully she'll come back. Uh, honey, are you ready to introduce yourself? Can you guys hear me better now? Yes, much better. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Hona Mandafu. I'm a triple A advocacy director. Um, my day-to-day -day operational focus at AAA is coordinating investigations in Ethiopia. We have a dedicated team in Ethiopia that investigates and tracks and documents atrocities against the Maras in different parts of Ethiopia. I also help uh, AAA with uh, media appearances, aligning with human rights organizations, and um, and also generally helping out with other activities. Looking forward to the conversation today, and thank you for joining. Excellent. Um, I see that uh, Dr. Sennight is attempting to rejoin. Uh, Sennight, if you're able to speak now, uh, please uh, go ahead. Otherwise, uh, maybe I can give my introduction. Okay. Okay, I'll just proceed then. Uh, my name is Robel Alamu. Uh, I'm a PhD student, uh, but I'm also Director of Communications at AAA. Uh, my responsibilities and duties at AAA uh, include uh, handling social media uh, co uh, handling, uh, as well as uh, editing and formatting of human rights reports, uh, as well as some media appearances. So I'm very excited to be part of this uh, discussion and uh, I'll, I'll be moderating this discussion. So I think we have some very interesting topics in line for you. Uh, and uh, I invite people to continue to invite uh, others, please circulate this link. But if you're unable to uh, stay for the entire uh, duration of it, it's also going to be recorded. Uh, and I see now that Dr. Senate has requested, so I'm going to uh, see, let's see if she can rejoin and uh, hopefully this time the audio is better. You can hear me. Um, I, I'll uh, yes, briefly wrap up the introduction. Yeah, so uh, we also cover um, some advocacy and, and diplomacy uh, work, which which uh, again is uh, very much involved in exposing the genocide that's going on against Tamaras, but also other targeted communities in Ethiopia, and try and expose how the problem is systemic, constitutional, um, and um, in general really integrated with the both the with, with the state actors as well as the non-state actors that co uh, coordinate within um, the state apparatus. Uh, we do have a, a major issue that uh, we are interested in which is really getting information on um, the counterterrorism part of the genocide, which is really getting information on the pet perpetrators, especially in this case, which is very important, as um, the victims themselves are being blamed uh, as perpetrators of the same crime that's affecting them. Um, generally, on some of the areas that Ted mentioned earlier, we do we do collaborate in the humanitarian uh, area of um, really raising funds for uh, IDPs and other victims of these crimes. So uh, in the interest of time, I would not repeat um, that part of our work. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dr. San Knight. So uh, I now see that uh, Dr. Fitzum is with us. Uh, Dr. Fitzum, if you're able to join the stage uh, and speak, uh, please do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we can maybe also invite somebody else, but let's see. Dr. Fitzum, if you're able to speak, uh, please uh, uh, give us an introduction of yourself as well as your uh, role at JPE and anything else that's relevant. Thank you. Um uh, good afternoon. This is uh, Fitzum Alame. Um, I'm a lawyer and uh, the legal director for GPE. Um, and I uh, appreciate this opportunity to 
speak and to present our views for the uh, uh, for the uh, the uh, people who are gathered here, and especially for the uh, the uh, envoy, uh, Mr. Hammer. Um, this, uh, I think, uh, you you people have talked about it. I joined late. I don't know who said what, uh, but I'm sure some of it was mentioned by by uh, the uh, the director for our uh, organization, Dr. Sunlight. But anyway, so what we are trying to do today, I believe, is uh, to have uh, our voice heard because uh, because uh, either the U.S. Uh, or the uh, the uh, European Union talked about the Tigray war and uh, and historically ignored um, about the fates of uh, about 40 million people in Ethiopia. Uh, when we talked about the Amhara people and the, the suffering, they, uh, they um, uh, went, uh, you know, they have gone through the past uh, 50 years, specifically the past uh, 29 years. Uh, we were not heard. Uh, Dr. Fusum, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're just doing a quick intro okay, okay, sorry. Uh, right now right. About, about your... Yeah, In that so case, I, I, no, intro, I will, I will yield and uh, come back. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, excellent. So now that we have our full panel, uh, I think uh, we're ready to start. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, be moderating this discussion uh, with such a distinguished panel, uh, lots of very insightful voices. Uh, and as I said, this is going to be about the roadmap for sustainable peace and accountability in Ethiopia. And really... Uh, you're going to be getting a really insightful uh, perspective from the Amhara community, or at least thought leaders in the Amhara community. So we're going to be touching uh, on a number of issues, uh, including the, um, I'm sorry, Dr. Fitz, I'm just going to ask you to mute. Okay, perfect. Uh, we're going to start with uh, discussions about sustainable peace. And as you know, this is going to be talking about uh, the ongoing peace talks in the Northern Ethiopian war and uh, really the challenges and uh, really the some of the concerns that the Amhara community has shared, especially with the idea of just not being included. Uh, and so I'm going to give everybody, uh, you know, hopefully three to five minutes to really just make your point briefly uh, and, and just straight to the point. Uh, and so whoever wants to start, uh, you can go ahead and then uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll go ahead. Kid. All right, Sanai, uh, go ahead. Or if you were speaking, go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Robel, and thank you, everyone who's gathered here. And I've just noticed when Dr. Fizum um, mentioned that uh, special envoy to Horn of Africa, my camera is here. Thank you for joining us. And everyone really uh, who's here gathered to, to really look at our, um, you know, listen to our perspective in terms of, you know, uh, the roadmap uh, for sustainable peace and accountability in Ethiopia. And and, and peace and account accountability, I truly believe, comes when we really genuinely gather to understand each other's uh, um, problems, each other's issues, and to even have like I, I we, we truly believe that it is important to have the stakeholders on the table to even understand the complexity of the problem, to even begin start giving solutions, or even um, you know forgive, forget, or move 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 along. Uh, unfortunately, in the context of what's happening in the north of Ethiopia, and this is not even covering uh, the continuous genocide that's going on against um, Haras and other targeted ethnic groups in Ethiopia because of the ethnic apartheid, apartheid system. Um, just as so that the, the UN and other, um, you know, uh, the international community are are really focused on at the moment um, the the war on the war in the north, especially the one that started in November 2020. Just focusing on that by itself, we can notice that the people, the Amara people, the Afar people, the, the the war has moved on to Amara region and Afar region, you know, since um, June um, 2021 and going forward. Uh, but um, a lot of the mainstream media to start with has been referring it as a Tigray uh, war to start with that has its own, um, you know, psychological and political and geopolitical connotations when the narrative is told uh, because there were like thousands and thousands 
thousands of people that are affected, actually hundreds of thousands of people, over 12 million uh, IDPs in the Amahara region alone, but then thousands of people that are also gang raped, raped, you know, all kinds of gender based violence. So when we talked, when everybody, all the stakeholders, the stakeholders talk about um, the effects of the war, because the topic of how it's um, framed in the mainstream media and everywhere, because everybody just refers it as uh, the war in Tigray, every single atrocity discussed by every single of us, like the entire Ethiopian people, whether they're Amara, Afar, Tigrayan, or the rest of Ethiopians, will be considered and 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 pictured in the in especially in non Ethiopians as if it happened in Tigray. So that by itself had a huge effect on on the victims. But the more important, uh, and and I'll just really quickly to give uh, a chance for the others. But the more other uh, important thing that really affected Amaras is the scope. Um, the scope kept on being because you can you can um, exclude victims by just drawing how you put your scope around uh, an event. When you start investigating on November 2020, you have no chance of looking at why this thing has started, what has happened before, especially when uh, complex issues about forcibly annexed areas like Welkite, Agadit, Alamt, and Raya is involved. Uh, no full context is given, and and all that um, I will uh, I will probably if I get a chance into it later on I will speak more into it. But I can definitely say that because of the way the scope is put and and put a fence around this, it already disadvantaged um, the, the Amara people who have been peacefully trying to get this forcibly annexed land back. And I just want to reiterate that these lands have not been forcibly uh, included, uh, also not according to the constitutional law, but uh, they were all just taken even be before this uh, constitution was put in place. Thank you very much, Roka. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sennight. Uh, a very uh, articulate uh, 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 discussion on this topic. Uh, next, I'd like to give the opportunity to Ted. Uh, Ted, if you're able to speak, uh, please uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, Robert. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Okay, great. I, I, um, you know, Dr. Sennight gave some context, and what I really would like to touch on um, is why, you know, we think that, um, you know, it's been very difficult to get the negotiations moving forward and why, you know, we think the negotiations ha ha have failed. And I think this is critically important because if we really actually want a lasting peace in Ethiopia and the broader Horn of Africa, we need to understand why, the you know, we why we can't get traction on the negotiations and what can be done to, you know, have real negotiations because, uh, you know, I, we, I think what we have seen is that, you know, neither party right now is able to have significant military, you know, upper hand, right? And so um, at the end of the day, we think there is going to be a negotiation, but if we move to, um, uh, towards negotiation, how do we, how do we accomplish that? Uh, you know, first on, in terms of like why we think the negotiations failed, um, you know, we, we believe that the West, you know, and this is including the EU, the United Nations, the United States, has a naive understanding of the, of the conflict. They don't understand that this problem is really structural. Um, uh, they mainly view this conflict as, as binary between the TPLF and the Abiy regime. And, and that has to, you know, that, that mindset or that thought process has to change. Um, the TPLF and the Abiy regime are also not ready for peace. Um, the push for negotiations was imposed on the TPLF and the Abiy regime, um, mainly by the Western governments uh, pressurizing uh, the Ethiopian government, both diplomatically and economically, um, and you know even imposing you know sanctions. So um, so this is an imposed um, uh, process on the two belligerents. Um, the two the negotiation process also was not inclusive. Um, Amaras, Afars, and Eritreans um, were excluded. So we, you know, we all knew that this was set to fail from the beginning. The special envoys that are assigned from the U.S., the U.N., the E.U., um, and even the um, uh, uh, Abu Sanjo um, uh, do not engage with Amara. So they do not engage with um, uh, Afar. So they do not engage really with the Eritreans. So if all the belligerents are not engaged, how can we expect any negotiations to move forward? The West thinks that they can get the TPLF and Abiy regime to come to an agreement and that the Amaras, Afars, and Eritreans will accept 
any outcome that, you know, this is really a naive policy. Um, uh, any agreement between these two, if they're able to even get an agreement, would not be seen as legitimate, credible, or binding by the excluded groups. Because Amaras, Afars, and Richards have their own concerns. They have security concerns. Um, there is also issues of, um, uh, of, of accountability that is really being ignored. And that leads me to the next point. Um, Ethiopian civil society groups were, um, were excluded from this process. So uh, all Ethiopians, you know, the message to all Ethiopians then is, you know, accountability for war crimes, for genocide was really not a priority because the only people that you had are the only groups that you had in this negotiation process were the two main, um, you know, um, uh, perpetrators of genocide. Um, it is also, in our opinion, you know, really deceitful to uh, invite the U.S., the United, um, uh, the European Union as monitors that exclude Amaras, who are the largest community impacted by this war. So by only having the also there by only having these two parties, the TPLF and the Abu regime, the negotiation process, uh, the African Union led process is at the mercy of only one of the belligerents. It only takes one of those parties to leave for the process to fail. And that's what we've seen over and over again. Right. So, um, you know, if, you know, if the TPLF or the Abbey regime, um, you know, decides to, um, you know, exit this process by like what we've seen in August 24th by the TPLF reinvading the North, uh, the Raya um, uh, Kobe area again and war resuming, then how can you have negotiations? Right. So that's why we believe that in order for this negotiation to move forward and uh, to keep the, you know, uh, all the parties accountable, um, we have to uh, open the negotiation process by including Amaras, Afars, and Eritreans. We cannot invite non-Ethiopians to this process and exclude Ethiopians. We also, there also has to be maximum pressure exerted on the TPLF to leave the Amara areas that it currently uh, occupies. And this has to be a precondition. Um, so th the TPLF can show good faith by leaving you know, um, you know, the entire North Wollo area. Um, and so, and, and I think this can help, you know, calm the situation down. Civil society groups also have to be in, invited into this process. If civil society groups are invited into this process, then Ethiopians will then can, will, will know and, 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 and understand that accountability for war crimes, human rights violations by all perpetrators will be also a priority and an outcome of this negotiation. So, you know, making it more inclusive um, in, in um, uh, you know, in opening, you know, to not just Amaras, Afras, you know, Eritreans, but also civil society and, you know, demanding that the, um, uh, that the, you know, TPLF leave the Amhara and any Afar areas that they currently uh, uh, occupy, we think will help move this process, you know, forward or else what we're going to have is just, um, a, a continuous war, and even if these two, if TPLF and Abu regime, were to agree on anything, uh, what you will have is basically, um, uh, you know, different groups coming together to continue this war because their interests and their concerns would not have been addressed. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Ted. Uh, some very clear uh, asks and some very clear points for uh, improvement in the conditions of these talks. Uh, next, I'd like to give the opportunity for Hona to, to continue. Hona, if you're able to speak. Yes, um, I'll just build on what Ted said, and I, I think I'll, I'll want, I want to ask uh, to take back to the original title, which is Sustainable Peace. Definitely, you know, the war needs to be resolved and peace have to return back to Ethiopia. But uh, we, should all, we should not forget that there was no peace even be in Ethiopia before November 2022. I think there's a misconception that, you know, up until the November 2022, Ethiopia was peaceful, which is not accurate, I think. Um, because several uh, think tanks that were following and tracking, you know, inter-ethnic or inter-communal violence or even armed uh, insurgency groups uh, pointed out, show that, there was increased uh, frequency of conflict in Ethiopia since 1991, since the current ethnic apartheid system was installed in the country. Uh, so we have seen steady increasement in number of, you know, armed uh, uh, fightings in the country 
over the three decades. And then, of course, uh, in 2018, uh, um, in 2018, the resistance against the TPLF-led um, regime in Addis Ababa um, reached a critical point to the point where TPLF was no longer able to rule the country with, with uh, you know, uh, gun uh, pointing guns on, on people. And therefore, they were forced into accepting uh, a new settlement, which led into uh, the Oromo Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, came to power. And uh, the Oromo forces generally took over power from the Tigrayan forces. Uh, so since then, I think, uh, there were an attempt to, to really push back against this new political settlement. And actually, it was not the Tigray region or TPLF that f- tried to um, challenge the central government. Uh, if we remember, uh, Abdi Ali, the Somali regional president, tried the similar thing TPLF did uh, in, in November 2020. But the difference was uh, the Somali region or Abdi Ali it was not as wealthy as sophisticated, as well-organized as TPLF. So Abiy was able to control the resistance from Abiy, from uh, Somali regional, some elements of Somali regional forces in a couple of days, and install uh, a new president uh, that's loyal to him. So the point I'm trying to make here is, one, there was no PC in Ethiopia even before this war in Northern Ethiopia erupted. Second, it's a structural, there is an incentive for regional governments to try to undermine the federal government because uh, there's a lot of power and the resource at their disposal and they wanna uh, claim more from the center, but at the same time also like to be not challenged uh, when it comes to, you know, minority protection in their their regions or uh, democracy. Um, So the, the, to, to bring sustainable peace in Ethiopia, we need to go beyond ending the ongoing wars. We need to go beyond, you know, this uh, violence that's uh, rocking the country to address the structural causes that led into the, the eruption of the war in Northern Ethiopia, but also the, the, the several conflicts that predate the war in Northern Ethiopia and some of them continuing. And really Amaras have been on the forefront advocating amendment to this ethnic apartheid system. Yes, there is, a, there is a reason for that because Amaras live across the country and uh, they were minoritized when these ethnic homelanders were created and uh, they were uh, prosecuted in many of these regions. Um, and therefore we talk about, as, we, as Dr. Sanaid alluded in the beginning, there has been you know, decades long Amara, Amara genocide in Oromia, Benishan Gulkomez, um, and several other areas. Um, and therefore, I think we have been at the forefront calling out the structural causes of this ethnic apartheid system and saying like how this will, uh, is, is dividing uh, Ethiopians against each other and fueling conflict and resentment and will eventually fragment the country as we have seen in other countries such as uh, Yugoslavia. But um, the more uh, Amaras are organizing, as we have seen over the last decade, I think it's a matter of time. Amaras will eventually, one way or another, will defend uh, their interest. And I think the, the smaller uh, population or the ethnic groups with a smaller population will be at the, at the forefront of you know, uh, dealing with uh, the problems that come with this ethnic apartheid system. And I think it's in the interest of Ethiopians and international actors to take on the willing of the willingness of Amaras to advocate against this ethnic apartheid system uh, in an attempt to bring sustainable peace in the country by addressing the root causes, the root causes of uh, the, the 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 conflict that we have seen in the country for for several decades, and it's uh, there is a, a misconception that you know um, only certain ethnic groups or Amaras don't want, you know, uh, certain am- amendment or I think there's a lot of disinformation regarding what Amaras want and what Amaras prefer. And I think we need to uh, work through this disinformation to really understand that when Amaras are advocating for amendment of the ethnic apartheid system, it's not just that they cannot turn around and use the system 
to advocate for their interests. To a certain extent, they are disadvantaged because they live across the country, but there's a way to work around that. It's really when we advocate for you know, amendment of this ethnic apartheid system, it's truly because we believe there will not be sustainable peace in the country unless with this ethnic homelanders and minoritized population and the idea of like classifying uh, Ethiopians based on ethnicity uh, and denying them citizenship rights in different parts of the country. Uh, this, w- this is not sustainable. This is not a project of building a country. It's a project of fragmenting the country. And we need to move away from that structural cause and address the constitutional amendment issue to bring peace back to Ethiopia in a sustainable peace, in a sustainable way. And I think that is what Amaras has been saying. And I think it's to the advantage of Ethiopians and foreigners interested in peace in Ethiopia to take up on this willingness among Amaras to really push back against this ethnic apartheid system and build more sustainable and more equitable system in Ethiopia. I'll stop there. Uh, Thank you, Hona. Uh, A very eloquent uh, uh, approach to address really the root structural causes of uh, the, the, the achieving sustainable peace in Ethiopia. Uh, next, I'd like to give an opportunity for Dr. Fitzum uh, to address this topic. Dr. Fitzum, if you're able to speak, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you. And I'm following up on uh, what has been said. My my understanding is uh, the biggest obstacle for this, uh, you know, this, uh, I mean, reaching to a peaceful settlement of all the conflict uh, and the and the war and the genocide of the the Ethiopian constitution and the state constitution. Uh, I I believe that the the constitution the state constitution has like are like leaking gas. Uh, and if somebody uh, like open a fire somewhere, it 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 it, it burns the whole country. And the reason I'm saying is that the framers of the constitution back then. Uh, 19, between 1991 to 1995, they um, they were anti maharas they were anti-Ethiopians. They intentionally uh, uh, wrote this constitution and state constitution to defranchise uh, Amharas and to get back, quote-unquote, to get back to the Amharas of the Neftanya system. That's why they intentionally, uh, you know, frame uh, the constitution and uh, the state constitution like the Oromia and the Ben Shangul constitution where we, we have seen uh, genocide being committed in the last uh, uh, 31 years uh, you know the, the states that uh, say that 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 the states belong to the Amharas the the Oromos and the Ben Shangul people respectively that's why the Amharas could not be elected, could not be, uh, um, you know, in the state government or be a police chief or uh, be in a position to protect their own people. And uh, this has been ignored. And this has, this is the one uh, which uh, gave a chance to uh, small kings like the TPLF being power in Tigray, the OPDO and the Abi people uh, being power in Oromia and others. Uh, in in uh, in uh, the states, and Abi and TPLF, you know, they have no problem with the kind of con- the current constitution. What they what they are fighting about is who is who should be in power uh, and uh, and and execute or implement uh, the constitution. That's why we see uh, a lot of uh, uh, problems, and uh, and uh, we. Um, we see the genocide being committed against Amharas. And the reason I'm saying is I want the special envoy and others to understand what is the root cause uh, of this conflict. And, and this constitution, as previously mentioned, was written to balkanize Ethiopia. And uh, the, the wars, the genocide, and the other, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, crimes against humanity and, and human rights uh, uh, problems are, uh, you know, the, the fruit of this poisonous tree. And if we, uh, if, if, uh, if, if uh, policymakers or people who are dealing with, with this issue to, to the issue of bringing peace in Ethiopia should understand what is the root cause, what are the grievances um, 
of the um, Amhara people, which makes about uh, about forty percent of the population now. And and if the interest of the uh, U.S. and and uh, the European Union is to see uh, a balkanized Ethiopia, or, or if the U.S. believe that that uh, a balkanized Ethiopia, divided Ethiopia, serve uh, its own interests or or the security interests of the U.S. and the EU or the region at all, then then that's a different understanding. But we believe that that. Uh, uh, a balkanized Ethiopia, uh, uh, an Ethiopia where there are conflicts, an Ethiopia where about 40% of the population uh, has no voice or suffers um, uh, from the atrocities of these two regimes uh, would not serve the best interests of uh, the United States or its foreign policy or its security policy, then they should, uh, they should listen to us uh, understand the root causes of, of, of the problem and uh, what is going on in Ethiopia. Uh, and and the, the, the media, uh, the, the U.S. media and the European uh, Union media, which has, which has a very cozy relationship with, with the State Department and the foreign ministries of uh, each European country, um, frame this as a Tigray war, as a Tigray genocide, or as if things, all the things are happening in Tigray, but not. So the main uh, battle uh, that we have seen uh, has been the, the Amhara land. Of course, there are uh, you know, atrocities and human rights violations in Tigray, but, but the main uh, uh, battles, the main victims uh, that we've seen uh, from our report, uh, either in the north part of the country, meaning in the, in the Amhara region, or the uh, or the Oromia region controlled by the Abi government. So we we need the special envoy and others who are involved with to understand this and to listen. And uh, if they understand, listen, then we go back to what what Teddy said. Then this victims should be on the table. That they should not only be heard, but but should be on that table, uh, which make a um, which make a decision about. Uh, what should happen in Ethiopia in the future, uh, meaning in any uh, uh, settlement, in any negotiation that will happen if it happens in the future, the Amharas should be, should be represented and others um, um, uh, who, um, who cares about human rights, who cares about um, uh, uh, the suffering uh, of, uh, of people in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, I'll stop here and then uh, yield back. Thank you. Excellent. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fitzum. Uh, I'm just going to uh, mute your mic. Uh, just apologies for the for some background. Uh, but I think you mentioned some very critical points. Um, I think uh, we keep coming back to these structural issues, the Constitution, uh, the exclusion of the Amharas. And I think it's very important to highlight this because when this Constitution uh, that the EPRDF the, TPF, the TPLF-led government, which took power in 1991, when that, when that government came to power and the constitution was drafted in, uh, I believe, 95, uh, that the process actually excluded Amharas. And so what we're seeing now is basically a, a deja vu moment where in 2022, Amharas, one of the largest groups, arguably the largest in Ethiopia, has been systematically excluded from determining the destiny of the country. So the country is at a crossroads. And in the past, we saw this major mistake of excluding the major stakeholders. And it looks like we're, we're going down the same path again. So it's very important for us uh, to really communicate uh, to everyone interested in achieving sustainable peace that this formula has been tried before and failed. And really the outcome last time was three decades of terrible human rights violations uh, this was a country that reverted to uh, be one of the worst for, for journalists, uh, for basic human rights, uh, it, by so many metrics. And it's interesting because when that, that process was ushered in, uh, we saw, for example, the, the former Tigray province, when it became the Tigray regional state, incorporate lands from historic Amhara provinces of Gondor and Wedlo. So these territories of Welkait and Raya were forcibly annexed and then the people faced a policy of apartheid and genocide. 
And that really was also the blueprint that was used in many other parts of the country where, you know, the same group that was excluded from the process of charting out the constitution became, you know, the, the victims essentially of genocide for years to come. And so at the, at the core of our advocacy, you know, the Amharic genocide is something that it's been a very, very large area of concern. And this is what we're very, very concerned with because it's something that has occurred uh, not only in the context of the war, for example, when the TPLF uh, re-intensified their full-scale inv invasion of the Rayak Obo area, uh, we saw, you know, a campaign of cleansing of door-to-door uh, -door killings, massacres against Amhara residents, and this was just uh, in in August, August of of last month, and it's continued till this month. But this was something that we saw in many other places. We saw it in Mykadra where the, the single worst atrocity of the war was committed. More than 1,500 Amhara civilians uh, si systematically targeted and killed by the TPLF forces. And these are staggering numbers. These are numbers that we have not really seen in any other conflict in the world. Imagine 1,500 people being selectively killed. And you know, wh where's, the, where's the response? Where's the repercussion? Where's the accountability? And this is something I think I'd like to explore in the next section of this talk, but um, really what I want to hammer is that the Samhara genocide, it's been happening in the North as, as part of the war uh, in, in occupied areas by TPLF, but also in the South by the Oromo Liberation Army. The Oromo Liberation Army uh, in various parts of the Oromia region has committed similar, if not worse atrocities in places like Tole. Tole, uh, the Tole massacre of, of hundreds and by some estimates even thousands of Amhara civilians was devastating. And then we, just recently we saw the Agamsa massacre. So we're just seeing these names come up and then we're seeing these staggering double digit, triple digit death tolls. So sustainable peace in the context of Ethiopia doesn't just mean you know a cessation of hostilities. There has to be some type of mechanism where this genocide, the structural causes of the genocide itself uh, need to be addressed. And this is something I think we've done on different platforms. We've addressed the structural causes of the genocide. But again, the constitution is a large cause of it. And then even how earlier I mentioned, uh, the, the first exclusion of Amhara has happened under the TPLF-led EPRDF. But now this is happening under the Prosperity Party led by the Oromo Prosperity Party and specifically the, the leadership under the leadership of Prime Minister Abi Ahmed. So Prime Minister Abi Ahmed is repeating the formula of his predecessor, uh, not predecessor, but his, his basically idol, uh, Medles Zainawi. And this is concerning because this is a formula for terrible human rights violations. And in, this, in the context of these peace talks, the exclusion of the Amharas is not surprising because we've also seen a mass crackdown earlier this year against Amhara journalists, Amhara Fano, Amhara uh, rights activists, political opposition, and we're still seeing this to this day. Just recently, we saw the arrests of several journalists because they were critical of the government. So if you have this country which, with, where there's no press freedom, but it's specifically there's an ethnic undertone, this is also part of the apartheid and the genocide because the people reporting on the genocide are essentially criminalized more than the perpetrators of the genocide. So uh, I'm going to stop here, but um, we, there's really a lot to say on this topic. And so before we move into the next section of this Twitter space, I see another um, uh, prominent guest in the, in the audience that I'd like to give an opportunity, uh, Dr. Desaling Chani. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Dr. Desaling is an MP uh, in Ethiopia and Amhara politician. Uh, Dr. Desaling, if you're able to join us and say a few words, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. I'm going to send you an invitation to speak. If you're unable to speak, that's completely fine as well, but we just wanted to give you a chance. Um, and if you're unable to speak, we can also move on to our next topic. So I'll, I'll just give you a few seconds, Dr. Desaling. And, and uh, really our next topic also is going to be kind of complementing what I just said, but it's gonna be moving away from the peace talks and towards accountability. So accountability, the the ICHREE, the International uh, Committee of Human Rights Experts on Ethiopia or the Commission, uh, released their interim report on their preliminary findings. And so this is going to be something that we would like to address, uh, but I'm just gonna give a few more seconds to Dr. Desaling. Dr. Desaling, if you're able to join us, uh, please uh, please do so, I've sent you an invitation. Uh, if now is not a good time, then uh, we can also try again later. 
And so I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing uh, the invitation accepted. So I'm going to assume now is not a good time, which is completely fine. So we're going to move on to the next section of this talk, which is about accountability. And uh, I, I'd like to maybe give um, Dr. Sen Knight uh, opportunity to start. If you'd like, Dr. Sen Knight. Uh, if if not, I can also go to maybe Hona. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Robert. Um, just before um, I talked about uh, in general about I talk about generally about accountability and specifically about this ICHREE advance or. Uh, preliminary report. I just want to add something about um, negotiations. Uh, there is a very uh, huge and bad side effect this uh, sort of negotiations is leaving um, that nobody, I mean, not many people have noticed. Um, just because strong men uh, with the with the presumption that, um, you know, of having uh, huge armed forces, uh, or just state actors being invited to the negotiating table um, to decide on the future of a, a country <laughs> that is, um, you know, being ethnically divided for over 30 years because of the politics we followed and a uh, population of over 114 million people with different views and, you know, with different experiences as the ethnic apartheid led to the experience of different view of Ethiopia for this different many people. But what's going on with this international actors is at the moment, um, it's just a matter of doing something as quick as possible and, uh, and pushing the problem under the rug. So what they choose to do is, uh, uh, you know, invite the groups that they think that they perceive are powerful, like the ones that have staunch uh, armies or, or you know, some sort of leverage over the negotiation. What that laid is into more bloodshed and and more uh, horrific uh, events. Because if if you've noticed the genocide and uh, and the, the ethnic based attacks all over the country, uh, they were usually of a uh, sporadic in nature. They usually are associated with some kind of hate speech or with some kind of political event. Uh, usually it's state sponsored. So whenever they try to cover up something like a national agenda, then these non state actors attack Amaras and um, like lately, uh, specifically Amaras, but uh, early in 2019, other ethnic groups were attack attacked in the South as well. Um, and then, you know, this happens with uh, obvious um, coordination where either um, com communication or electricity, um, you know, uh, gets interrupted and, and they, they carry on um, their crimes against humanity, genocide, ethnic cleansing, etc., mass murders, etc. But now we're seeing a large scale siege, sort of what uh, TPLF always uses for Tigray. So what we're seeing in Walaga now, where the, the entire non-state actors coordinating with local state officials, uh, taking over the entire zones, so this obviously is being motivated by, you know, uh, the international community and the state actors and people giving table to those, you know, who just act illegally, belligerent and take stuff in their own hands. So now it's just beyond, uh, you know, like um, motiva uh, hate motivated or single specific issue motivated genocide, but it's a way of getting on the table. This is OLA's way of getting on the table to decide on the future of Ethiopia because it had seen that TPLF is allowed on the table for doing exactly the same thing for, uh, you know, uh, committing my cadre for, uh, you know, <laughs> following, uh, killing uh, North Command members uh, in their sleeps. So this is setting a bad example to start with, uh, but also not not involving the, you know, the the the, the, the communities who are in the receiving end. It would just really Really set bad example, and as uh, Dr. Fisu may know, and in, in various ways have mentioned it earlier, that uh, the people who are being constantly being attacked, they, uh, you know, we're humans, we adapt, we evolve. So we will start looking at, you know, other ways of defending ourselves too, because this is the dynamics we're seeing. So this is something that I want to put forward before commenting on the ICHRE -E comment um, document. On the ICHRE uh, document, I'll just make a very brief because we haven't really thoroughly um, looked and investigated um, at the whole thing. 
But what really stood out, um, before I get into what we're really um, concerned about, uh, I just want to talk about the process. So um, the Ethiopian government has uh, straightforward rejected the, the, the existence of this body. But uh, for reasons unknown, in the end, it allowed this, um, this body to get into the country. So, but again, it wasn't allowed to, they were not allowed to go into Tigray. They were also not allowed to talk to the IDPs uh, from Walaga or Matakal or uh, North Shawa, these other three areas where the, the committee is mandated to look at on top of the crimes that um, that might have happened uh, related to the war, that is uh, Tigray region, Amara region, and Afar region. But what ended up happening was them not having any access and them really getting just remote reports from all sides. Uh, that I, I want everybody to to take note of that because uh, it, it is really a huge disservice to um, the victims that were uh, that suffered at the hands of TPLF uh, or Tigrayan forces, as mentioned in the in the document, uh, where there was a possibility for them to talk to these investigators, but it was by the government, barred by the government. So this is a note that uh, we want to take. On top of that, the ICHREE documents, I just want to focus on the gender-based violence part. Um, for me, uh, uh, the GPE um, gave data on about 850 women that were affected that uh, by this GBV violence, uh, cr crimes, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, that... Uh, uh, that uh, happened to them by the Tigrayan forces that invaded the Amhara region, but I'm sure other organizations did the same as well. Okay, not mentioning the figure, uh, it might be another, um, you know, uh, procedure that they follow. We will we'll wait until, um, you know, they come up with the final report. But what what I found, it, what my colleagues found reprehensible, uh, really concerning and shameful, is that the report allows the criminals to talk through the victims. They put the testimony of what the rape victim said. They just, you know, the, the, the criminals told them we're doing this because of what happened in Tigray. This is a perfect framing of taking over the criminal's narrative through the mouths of the victims. This is the most horrific thing that any investigator could do. If that was the case, testimonies from the Tigrayan side also should have been presented in there. To start, the same thing has been repeated by the uh, for the two women. They say that grand uh, the grand forces. They call it. Um, I prefer to call it TPLF because I don't want to transfer TPLF's crimes to the entire grand forces, but uh, people. But anyway. Um, the, these two people that the two Eritreans reported as being affected again in the same manner they say they take their testimony and say we're doing this because of what Eritrea did to uh, to grants so this is a, a very typical way of a shameful way of transferring the criminals narrative through the um the, the the victims mouths which which should have a lot of care should have been taken um a lot of analysis and context should have been given and it hasn't been done across the board it was only specific to amaras and uh, eritreans victims uh, which is really honestly shameful and i call upon the un women's association um uh, agency sorry uh, to really deal into this since uh, their team currently is about justice for women thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Sennight, uh, uh, for a very uh, uh, in-depth uh, uh, look at uh, some of the concerns that our community has had with this report, just at a glance. Um, uh, I, I just want to also go back, and uh, earlier I tried to give uh, an opportunity for Dr. Uh, DeSelling to, to comment, just to quickly uh, speak. Um, so, Dr. DeSelling, I'm going to send you another invitation. If you're able to speak now, uh, please go ahead. Uh, if not, it's completely fine. Uh, and I can go to uh, Hona next. Okay. Uh, Hona, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thanks, Rob. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, I think uh, there were wars or fightings that have been happening in the country throughout the last three decades. And we, when we talk about accountability, although it's, uh, you know, there's a, uh, an ongoing war and uh, and uh, you know a need for accountability for atrocities committed within that context of the war. I think we need to frame it in a way that uh, brings back the the crimes committed 
particularly against the Maras over the last uh, 30 years. Um, as we mentioned, you know, the, there has been systemic oppression and, and, and uh, genocide against the Maras for uh, decades. And when we talk about accountability from our perspective, we're talking about accountability for all these crimes. And that is, I think, part of, uh, part of uh, the context for this war was, you know, uh, attempt us to hold perpetrators of crimes against uh, Amaras and, and other peoples in Ethiopia um, by the central government at the early stage of, you know, at the early days of Abiy's administration were perceived as targeting Tigrayans, which I think is a mis- misunderstanding. I think uh, several TPLF leaders are implicated in crime and, um, and the, there is a still an outstanding issue of like holding them accountable not just for what they did since uh, this war started, but what they did before that, and uh, and uh, uh, the, the the sentiment of like you know entitlement and notion of supremacy uh, to, to kind of you know refuse to be equal in the Ethiopian state. I think TPLF has that culture of you know uh, claiming to be bigger than everybody else, and I think in some way uh, that needs to be checked, and uh, that to me is part of holding them accountable for the way they ruled the country for more than uh, three decades. But when it comes to, you know, the the ICHREE, the commission, I think, for brevity, and that's that's what they, they call themselves in the document as well, uh, there are good things because uh, it allows this kind of justice. Uh, they, they are mandated to talk, to bring transitional justice uh, to Ethiopia. And... That is something we've been asking as Amaras. We need transitional justice. We need to go back and look at how uh, different communities were affected over the last three decades. And we need to have a conversation about you know, holding uh, perpetrators accountable and um, changing systems that enabled these crimes to be committed at such massive level, massive scale, and reform the systems so that you know, any future leaders will not be able to commit this cross atrocities, genocide against the Maras, and uh, rule uh, without uh, any accountability. And there's an element of transitional justice that this commission has, and its mandate kind of bring forward, and that's something Ethiopia needs. But the problem is, I think this transitional justice and the overall mandate of this commission is is limited to look into uh, events that transpired after uh, November 2020, uh, after November 2020, which is, you know, the the, the beginning of this uh, ongoing war in Northern Ethiopia. And I think that is something we have, uh, we have expressed concern in the past. And we said like, you know, we need a mechanism that go beyond uh, that to, to, to really unpack what transpired uh, over the last three decades and how that is linked into the war in northern Ethiopia because uh, as I suggested earlier there's an element of you know refusal uh, refusal for uh, account- any form of accountability by TPLF leaders and them starting a war as a way of you know uh, uh, evading accountability as you remember one of the key figures that Ethiopian is who want to hold accountable as uh, as uh, the former chief intelligence leader uh, Getacho Asafa, TPLF refused to give up him or to even allow where uh, share information where he is while still keeping him as member of uh, the their central committee. So I think we need to tie how this accountability effort by Ethiopians for the last three decades is tied up into the war and how the war started because of the PLF's refusal to allow some form of accountability. But um, the commission itself, I think, uh, as we said in the past, you know, uh, there is an opportunity to look into what transpired uh, or what atrocities committed against Amaras in other regions, because uh, the mandate uh, gave us this commission an opportunity to look into all allegations of crimes uh, um, in, in throughout Ethiopia, as long as it falls with the timeline of like after November 2020. And I think the report really fails to execute that mandate because they, they limited themselves to uh, a number of selected cases 
to in Amara and Tigray region. And to some extent, it's understandable because the commission was struggling to set up itself. There was funding issues and all that. But the more problematic uh, uh, element of, you know, what we learned from this report is that their selection of cases is ending up repeating the, some of the, 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 the incidents that were covered by the Joint Investigation Task Force of the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission and, and the, the UN Human Rights Office. Because initially, they were mandated to complement, but they, they seem to backtrack that mandate, and now they're saying they don't. They are not abide to, object, uh, to reject or accept the JIT findings. But if you say complementing the findings, you basically build on that. You basically don't repeat the investigation that were covered in in the JIT, and rather shift your attention to areas that were uh, not covered in the JIT report, which is Afar and Amars. So I think the first point I want to make is the selection of cases is really not fair because there was an opportunity to build on the JIT report as, as they were uh, mandated and f- bring more uh, stories from Amar, uh, Amara region and Afar. And instead, they kind of went into to rep- reproducing certain certain incidents in Tigray and uh, completely ignoring uh, uh, allegations of crimes in, in Afar. Um, but also, even after they limit themselves to Tigray and Afar, Amara, when we see the cases they selected in Amara, it was really those cases that were covered in the media, um, and they excluded other cases that uh, uh, could have shown a different pattern of crimes by TPL. For instance, the shelling of uh, uh, you know civilian uh, houses in Debra Tabor and even the hospital in Debra Tabor. That's a different kind of crime that's not covered. And so they select. They are saying they select cases to unpack trends. And I think they could have done a better job by diversifying the cases they covered in Amara region by looking at more uh, more cases. For instance, in, uh, in the FAS Moja, as uh, findings by Amnesty and others have shown, there were crime, uh, crime, uh, sexual and gender-based violence that amount to sexual slavery because leaders of TPLF army took women, as we have learned uh, from other investigations, for days. And that is what sexual slavery is implying to. But because they avoided that, one of their findings is, is like, you know, TPLF uh, uh, leaders uh, committed crimes uh, against uh, gender or sexual and they committed rape and sexual uh, violence. But they say, like, you know, there were no indications of sexual um, slavery, but I think if they had covered in the first mocha, they would have able to uncover that. So there is an, uh, an issue of selection of cases, but along with that, there comes you know they are saying they inter- they interviewed 185 people, and one has to wonder how many of them were from Amara region, how many of them from Tigray region, and how many of them were from t- t- refugees of Eritrean background. And it seems that there is. A, from the report and the overall findings, I think it's reasonable to assume that most of these people interviewed were from Tigray. And this is something I think we hope the commission will clarify in future communications. I think they have to specify of these 185 people they interviewed, how many were from different regions, because that's uh, one measure of you know, uh, fair coverage uh, and their uh, attention, fair, balanced, or balanced attention to different communities. Uh, some of the findings, I think, Dr. Sanai have brought up the issue of, uh, you know, the number of sexual and gender-based uh, violence victims in Amara region. But also, I think another element is uh, the the issue of uh, humanitarian uh, access, because the report, unlike the JIT, um, kind of implies that or accuse the Ethiopian government of using, you know, blocking humanitarian access as a way of warfare, which is, I think, uh, it's a, a big allegation that I don't think is well substantiated, but uh, I don't want to dwell on that too much. But instead, I want to highlight uh, the fact that t- some uh, TPLF-controlled areas 
in Amara, such as uh, Wagumra, such as Adargai, they never had access to humanitarian aid for more than a year. So if you accuse the Ethiopian government of using you know, uh, humanitarian blockage as, a, as, a, as a one form of doing war, why not you call out TPLF for ref- blocking humanitarian access uh, to uh, Amaras in Amara region? such as Darka and Wagamara. I think that's a big issue. I think the commission has to uh, address uh, moving forward. Um, so I would, I, would, I would conclude by saying that, you know, we understand uh, the challenges the commission has faced and really some of the blame uh, in terms of like, you know, the stories from Amara region and Afar not coming forward would have to go to the Ethiopian government because they continue to refuse access. Uh, but I think the fact that they they they, uh, um, they kind of you know co- conducted remotely and and conclude uh, certain uh, uh, con- arrive at certain conclusions, but kind of underplayed the crime by TPLF as I explore as I mentioned earlier, is a troublesome development because it might lead to Ethiopians to question the objectivity and the partiality of the commission. And I, I want to invite the commission people to take this concern very seriously and address it uh, in the future in the future uh, engagement as we hope the commission's mandate will be reviewed in the coming days. And Tripoli has had you know, multiple engagements with the commission and we hope we'll continue to engage with the commission and other relevant stakeholders to uh, table this uh, concerns directly to relevant people within the commission and hopefully address them satisfactorily in the coming years. I'll stop there. Thank you, Hona, uh, for a very uh, in-depth analysis of the report and uh, really some very important concerns uh, in the Amhara community, especially from AAA. Uh, Before I continue, uh, I'd like to give Dr. Fitzum a chance to comment on this topic. Dr. Fitzum, if you're able to speak, uh, please uh, go ahead. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, the, uh, the theme of this uh, part is what needs to be done, um, I believe. Uh, and uh, I think the first thing I would ask the U.S. is to push with the U.N. to send uh, a special rapporteur to investigate the atrocities, especially in the Oromia and the Ben Changul region, as well as uh, the north part of the Amhara region. Second is... Um, the TPLF and OLF, uh, they are um, raising funds here in the U.S. Uh, with their offices um, like five miles from where I am now in Alexandria, Virginia. They openly operate, hire lobbyists and openly raise funds to commit genocide. The U.S. Uh, was not tolerant for such kind of activities if it, if it was uh, when it was or were committed by other groups. So the U.S. should use, uh, you know, its uh, legal authority and its Justice Department to, to stop um, uh, any fundraising activities uh, that uh, is used for uh, genocidal act. The other I would ask is, um, you know, the U.S. has been a major uh, speaking corner for a genocidal speech here in the U.S. Even though there is a freedom of speech, but that freedom of speech uh, in the Constitution otherwise is limited uh, such a way that it would not, it should not call for a genocidal act overseas. So the YouTube and Facebook privately owned organization are um, are used. Um, uh, as a as a medium as a as a tool uh, for a genocidal speech, so then the U.S. should uh, um, ask or work with YouTube and, and Facebook to to alleviate that. Um, and the other thing is um, they mentioned uh, three or four times is who is who should sit on the table, who should sit on that that um, if it happens in in the. Uh, Negotiating table, or this, where where if there is any effort to settle this um, conflict in in a peaceful manner. So, if if only TPLF uh, and and OPD are allowed, then the other group, as mentioned previously, um, are left out. Then there will not be a sustainable peace. So, as any um, 
as any human being would do uh, when when it is threatened, it sets up its own self defense unit. And Fano has been the self defense unit for the Amar people. But Fano has been painted by the West media um, and uh, and government forces as if as as if uh, you know it is. It is a group that that commits genocide and been mentioned in, in in reports, but Fan also should be given uh, a chance to sit uh, at this negotiating table, to uh, also should be heard uh, to be heard on its grievances and on, on and and on its effort to to defend the Amhara people from from the ongoing genocide in the north. Um, I also ask the U.S. government, as it has its representation in the in the. Ethiopian capital to look into the hundred thousands of stranded um, Amhara people in the Oromia region. Uh, some um, of my colleagues, some of my friends who really care about human rights, thinking about evacuating them or putting them back to the Amhara region, but that's not acceptable. I think uh, they should they should stay there and uh, and uh, prosper and live uh, peacefully and participate in their. Um, in the government of their affairs, and the U.S. through USAID and other organizations should help them. Uh, you know, you know, uh, they should go and visit w- with them and uh, see you know, what kind of humanitarian and other aid they should uh, they are seeking, and uh, should help them out. Um, as uh, already money has been allocated for USAID for Ethiopia, and that that some of that money should be used for their um, well-being. Um, so all things considered, I think the U.S. should not only look this as a, as a, uh, uh, you know, as a mediator or the or, or a person or an, an entity or a government to help uh, Abiy government uh, and the TPLF to settle the matter, uh, even though the their conflict is power, but uh, because of the the the, the war. Um, they have uh, caused the suffering of millions um, of Ethiopians, mainly the Amharas, and the, sh- the U.S. as it did today through its uh, envoy. Um, um, once it listened, uh, it should continue listening to to everybody and allow everybody to be heard and uh, and uh, try to help Ethiopia find a long-lasting solution. That long-lasting peaceful. S- uh, uh, solution or a solution that that brings peace to Ethiopia, it brings peace to the region, and uh, I and I believe will serve the best interests of the the US government. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fitzum, uh, for addressing uh, another uh, another angle of, of the of the discussion. Uh, it's greatly appreciated. So uh, next, I'm just going to touch on some key points. Um, uh, I think I heard lots of very uh, fascinating uh, discussions from or, or talking points from various of the sp- various speakers. Uh, but just from the perspective of AAA, AAA has met with the commission investigators and has not only provided information but also, uh, you know, emphasized concerns and really the approach going forward. And I remember one of the uh, critical agendas was actually ensuring that the atrocities in the Oromia region were investigated, specifically the Amhara genocide uh, against Amharas in the various parts of Wadlega and of other parts of the Oromia region. And so unfortunately, despite this uh, uh, really strong effort, this part of the investigation was not seen in, in this interim report, or, sorry, or rather it was not conducted. Uh, the hope is that uh, you know there could be some course correction through future meetings. AAA will continue to engage with the ICHREE or the Commission uh, on this issue because it's a very important issue for the Amhara community. Because prior to the war, uh, this was an issue that really was uh, a top agenda item, and this was ethnic cleansing, genocide of Amhara communities, entire Amhara communities in places like Oromia region and Benishan Gugumuz, and sometimes even um, bordering regions. So. This was the Oromo Liberation Army, uh, but in some cases, even atrocities by the state forces, the Oromo Special Forces. These are the regional forces that are supposed to protect civilians. And in many of AAA's reports, there have also been uh, clear indications of state complicity. This is complicity from the Oromia regional government uh, under the leadership of Shimad Les Abdisa, as well as the, the federal government under uh, Abiy Ahmed Ali. And so this is a very important uh, 
uh, element of the investigation. And independent investigations are really at the at the forefront of any uh, sustainable peace for Ethiopia and for uh, the well-being of the Amhara people. And I think I heard many uh, interesting things, especially on the Oromia um, element. And earlier we talked about, you know, the allegation of the Ethiopian government using uh, starvation as a weapon of war. But really, the Amharas in Walegda are under uh, a blockade, but also a, a siege by the Oromo Liberation Army. But they're also unable to leave because blo uh, roads are blocked. Much of the time, uh, these defense forces that are stationed there to, to protect them are actually uh, removed all of a sudden. And then these uh, terrorist forces are able to just come in, commit the massacres. And in some cases, after the fact, the victims are then framed as the victimizers. And so irresponsible and reckless reporting has actually uh, exacerbated the genocide against the Maharas. And this has been a very uh, large area of concern. So in independent investigations are very, very, very critical, especially in the Oromia region. And uh, throughout the Amhara region, I think in the context of this report, um, there are many areas that were missed. And the problem is that when some of the, when, when the when the wide breadth of, you know, the, the characterizations of these atrocities is not fulfilled, then it paints the picture that the greater extent of the atrocities committed against the Amharas and even the Afar communities are not as extensive as they appeared. So there was language, I think, in the report that um, insinuated that, you know, re regardless of what happened to the Amharas, what happened to Tigrayans was was substantially larger. And I think this this is something that needs to be challenged because the Amharas um, since 2020, mid 2021, were pretty much facing the, the full, well, not pretty much, they were completely facing the full brunt of war. The war had effectively left the Tigray region and was completely in the Amhara region. And then contrary to popular belief, amidst the so-called ceasefire, there were actually areas of Amhara region that were still under TPLF occupation. And so areas in the north, in Talemt, in um, Waghimra, in Raya, were under occupation. And even now, in the newest, in the third phase of the genocidal invasion by the TPLF into the Amhara region, um, the, the base of operations are actually majority Amhara districts, places like, or towns like Koram, towns like Alamata, which uh, faced decades of, of TPLF atrocities going back to the, the constitution and the, the ethnic federalism arrangement in which uh, the territories of Wadqait and Raya were actually forcibly annexed. So these are people who have, uh, who have lived under TPLF apartheid and genocide for many years. And this is why uh, it's very important to, to include them in the discussion. So there's been large, large scale uh, displacements from these areas. But then if we go even to Amhara region proper, um, you know, these are, there are many, many areas that were missed. So when we talk about, for example, in this investigation, atrocities in places like um, uh, Makale, Makale is a very metropolitan area. And so no metropolitan areas of that size were really part of the investigation uh, into atrocities uh, in Amhara region. For example, Dese, Dese is a very large city, uh, Kambolcha, very large city, and many others were under TPLF occupation. And this is where we heard some of the worst atrocities. In fact, things like uh, Amhara civilians being rounded up and burned alive. Even in some cases, even uh, Eritrean refugees or Eritreans that were burned alive. And then, you know, attacks against IDP camps. So in order to capture the full extent of the atrocities, there needs to be a wider um, consideration. I understand there was limitations with, uh, you know, financing resources, manpower, all of these things, but this is something that's critical because otherwise the, the reality of what happened gets diminished. When the reality of what happened gets diminished, we can't expect the victims to get justice because the crimes committed against the Amhara people, as I said, actually precede the war. So we're not even getting into the, the, the pre-war, uh, the crimes, the ethnic cleansing, the genocide. And, you know, when we talk about things like hate speech, Amharas were probably, not probably, not, not even arguably, the number one victim of, of genocidal hate speech online from before the war. Much of the ethnic cleansing and genocide in Oromia was actually triggered by hate speech on, on, on platforms like Facebook, pl platforms like uh, Instagram, TikTok, in which people were openly calling for the killing of Amharas. And then in the context of this war, I, I pinned a, a clip above of where the TPLA forces were actually indoctrinated to not only invade into the Amhara region, but to exact revenge, so-called revenge. So this was, regardless of what happened, they were indoctrinated to 
commit the worst kinds of heinous crimes. So if we compare the, you know, maybe what was told to the Ethiopian National Defense versus this, it's very clear that from the get-go, before the invasion even started of the Amhara and Afar regions, they were instructed to do the worst they possibly could. And so imagine on this scale, people being instructed to do the worst they possibly can. That's where we can see the worst kinds of evil possible uh, by human beings. And so I just call upon uh, some careful consideration of what, what's been happening and, you know, uh, for, for broadening of the perspectives. But I think I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm just going to ask Ted, Ted, if there's anything you wanted to add, uh, please, uh, please go ahead. Um, nothing really. I think you all have covered it. If I need to say anything, I can just, uh, I'll reserve it for a Q and A. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so uh, I think at this point we've covered uh, two very broad but important subjects, the, the areas of sustainable peace, in which we talked about the peace negotiations uh, in the context of the current war, uh, and really the, the, the concerns over exclusion of Amharas as you know, one of the largest groups in Ethiopia, if not the, if not the largest, being excluded uh, from, from peace talks, from determining the destiny of their own country. So this is a problematic stance that's been held by the international community that needs to be amended. And this is one of the very um, uh, utmost concerns from the Amhara community. So we went from that to accountability and we talked about the commission's uh, interim report that was released yesterday and some of the concerns with that. Uh, and so at this point, um, I'd like to give an opportunity for a Q and A. So uh, members of, the, of, our, of our community who are uh, in the audience, if you'd like to, at this point, come up and uh, share some 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 um, some perspectives on these topics, related topics, uh, just uh, we, we invite you to do so. But just be sure to introduce yourself, including your name, uh, any organizational affiliations, uh, and and we'll go from there. Thank you, Robel. I think um, Dr. Desalang was having an issue with his mic. I think he's resolved it. So uh, maybe if you can invite him up, he might be able to uh, say a few words. Okay, uh, ap apologies, I forgot to uh, check again. Uh, Dr. DeSaling, I've now sent you another invitation. So please um, uh, join us on the stage if you're able to speak and uh, we'll, we'll give you the opportunity to, to, to speak. So I've sent you the invitation. Um, and if, uh, if, there, if, there, if the issue can, uh, persists, please let us know and uh, we can maybe come back to you later if that's the case. But if not, I've, I've sent you an invitation. Uh, excellent, okay. W welcome to the stage, uh, Dr. Desaling. Thank you, Rowell. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, express my appreciation for Amahara Association of America, as well as the genocide prevention in Ethiopia. Uh, you guys are doing an amazing job in uh, documenting, uh, uh, creating awareness for the international community and for uh, for the Ethiopians in the diaspora uh, regarding the ongoing uh, massive, massive uh, atrocities that are, that are perpetrated against the Amhara people in Ethiopia. So thank you very much. And I really enjoyed uh, all the discussions, all the uh, the, the, the points that were raised. Uh, so I, I would like to just raise two important points that are uh, reflected throughout the discussion. The first important thing is that uh, the, the, the representation of Amharas in, in the ongoing uh, uh, peace processes on the ongoing uh, negotiations uh throughout our uh, political engagements here in Ethiopia with the uh, international community uh with uh, the diplomatic community we have been saying w w what has been said so we said that this negotiation should not be uh, between the prosperity party and the the TPLF so the, the the process, the whole process that the, that Prosperity par Party handled this peace uh, negotiations was only uh, decided through the party channels, but not uh, through the government structure. So we believe that uh, Amharas uh, have uh, faced uh, the 
the brunt of all this war. So we believe that uh, Amhara civic societies and uh, Amhara political parties, uh, especially parties that are represented in the parliament, should be included uh, through uh, the peace talks, through these uh, negotiations. Otherwise, uh, as uh, most of the speakers uh, clearly pointed out, it's going to be uh, a negotiation of power sharing between the TPLF and uh, the Prosperity Party. So we have to keep pushing on on the issue of uh, the the representation of Amharas through through the the peace process. And regarding uh, accountability and uh, uh, the issue of uh, TPLF's uh, track record of uh, uh, participating in a disciplined uh, bargaining process, in a disciplined uh, uh, political uh, uh, political uh, bargaining, po uh, disciplined uh, negotiation. I, I, I truly have uh, a concern in that TPLF throughout its history has never engaged in a disciplined political bargaining process. I believe that TPLF uh, cannot and will not be uh, trusted unless its uh, capabilities are effectively uh, weakened and uh, diminished. So throughout our discussion, we, we, we should uh, bear in mind that TPLF is uh, uh, a group that only understands power and force and i believe that we should be uh, we should be cautious in in uh, in uh, our uh, articulation and uh, uh, in our approach uh, regarding tplf's uh, uh, good phase uh, in in when when we have been listening uh, from from the different groups, from the TPLF sympathizers, from TPLF supporters, that they are really committed for peace. But uh, I, I, I truly have uh, uh, a reservation in that the the culture, the the modus operandi of TPLF is not that of uh, a disciplined. Uh, 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 it's not a group that uh, can uh, truly be committed for uh, a negotiated peaceful settlement. I believe that TPLF uh, several times tries to uh, confuse and uh, uh, confuse the international community and the Ethiopians in, in a way to buy time to reorganize and to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, launch another uh, organization. Uh, I, I can't hear Dr. DeSelling. Is it the same for anyone else? It, yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, he's calling in, he's dialing in from Ethiopia, so he might be yeah. having network issues. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dr. DeSelling, um, we so can't hear you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, let's keep uh, uh, pushing. Let's keep the good fight. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. DeSelling. Uh, we, we missed um, just the, the, the last segment of what you were saying. Uh, I think there was um, uh, an audio uh, interruption, uh, but I think we got the main the main points that you were that you were delivering. So we thank you so much for joining us and delivering those points. Um, now, uh, I'd like to give before we move on to taking more questions or more statements from audience members. I'd like to give uh, an opportunity for the speakers on the stage. Uh, who spoke earlier, if they want to add anything, just very briefly, maybe one minute, uh, based on what's been discussed. I'll uh, quickly go, um, and then it's not really to wrap up, it's just one other dimension that I haven't mentioned earlier. Thank you for the opportunity, Robert. And before I do that, I would really uh, want to um, thank Dr. Dasalin really for all the times that you've raised the voices of those victims 
and the, the victims of genocide in, in, a, in, in when they had no one um, in the in the house, you and your colleagues from NAMA. Uh, we, I'm really, really respectful of that, and I'm sure uh, my colleagues are as well, and as well as all the, the, the people who've already uh, showed you their appreciation for um, how you have become a voice there. Um, that is really, truly the meaning of being a representative. Um, moving on the dimension, and, and it's just really a generic thing that I want to mention, is that there is a lot of confusion regarding the political configuration of what's going on around Ethiopia, the geopolitics of it, um, the international community. And I just really want to mention, especially for Amaras, or uh, also all other Ethiopians who really in good faith want peace uh, for our country, um, the, this really block thinking of saying, I have, um, you know, when I posted about the uh, specific ICHREE finding uh, regarding the uh, gender based violence, uh, you know, section that they reported on regarding the war, there were some um, comments, and this is not just really uh, publicly, but have been sent to me as well, that, you know, the West is inherently against Samaras, etc. Really, let's not fall for this trap. Because at the end of the day, who've been hurting us are our own brothers and sisters. Um, you know, other implicit biases may have been existed because of may have um, existed because of historical uh, engagement in the past. Because you know, Ethiopia is an ancient country. Um, we've, we've had a lot of contacts and a lot of you know um, history in the back. But right now, what's happening is happening because we are not represented enough. Uh, we are being disfranchised. We are not organized. We're not able or not in good numbers able to articulate our problem, the complexity to the international community um, and all other actors and stakeholders, even to the to our own enemies as well. You know, we are not able to show our unity. Um, there are a lot of efforts being done, including with my, uh, you know, uh, with my colleagues from AAA, uh, all the people and the movements from, you know, back home, my own colleagues from GPS, well, and all other organized associations and people who are organized and who are trying to to rectify the situation individually. But it's not enough. We have to articulate our problems well, and we have to be able to show. Uh, and indicate the complexity of the problem. And the last thing I want to say um, before I wrap up is, let's not forget, even if there are, we have people at home and abroad uh, who can articulate this very well, but the framework that is set up around, uh, you know, uh, the groups that are meant to, to solve the solution in Ethiopia are um, like systematically made, uh, organized or structured in a such a way uh, they only allow, quote unquote, what they call the federalists to, to be a, a voice. Even if they are they hate each other's guts, just like Dr. Fusum and others say that they have a power contest at the moment, when it comes to letting ethnic Amaras or other groups who are against the, this ethnic apartheid inherently, when it comes to that, because it touches on their common interest, they systematically avoid uh, voices from Amaras and, or others, uh, like Hona said, it's not only Amaras who are against the system, but specifically Amaras because we're uh, we're undergoing an active ongoing genocide that needed to be covered up for them to remain in power. So let's not forget whatever goes on in Ethiopia, even the, the, the few organized people we have who could be a voice are not allowed to be a voice. And they always, uh, you know, see each other and make sure that those voices are not heard heard by all these invoice, uh, all these people who try and come and solve the problem. So let's move away from just blaming the West uh, blank in a blanket way, and let's find this narrow pathway which allows us to have our voice heard and articulated very well and take our destiny in our hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sennight. Uh, a very um, important point uh, not to not to just you know blanketly blame, but also just to use the opportunities to speak and make our voices heard. Um, if, if any other speakers who spoke before want to just briefly speak, uh, please. Uh, Ted, did you want to speak? Sure, uh, I'll, I'll just jump in very quickly here. Um, you know, earlier on, you know, we touched on why uh, the negotiations failed, and um, you know, gave recommendations on how to move forward. Uh, so that we 
have a, 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 pro, a negotiation process that um, has a chance of um, really uh, holding and, uh, and that's, that's inclusive of all of the actors, including civil society. So we gave essentially a roadmap to uh, have a much more inclusive process that includes all Ethiopian actors and not just, um, you know, not Ethiopians as we've seen. But I want to touch on a little bit of some of the major issues, the unique issues that Amaras, you know, um, uh, you know, would like to address in any negotiation, right? Um, and, and these are unique Amara issues. And one of the things that Amaras would like to uh, address is in, um, in, uh, and make sure that their voices are heard is the uh, a final resolution on World Guide and Raya. This is a uniquely Amara issue that cannot be, um, uh, you know, represented by the TPLF or the Abbey administration, right? So this is one of the reasons. Uh, another uh, another issue that's critically important that has been voiced by everyone here on this on this panel, uh, including Dr. Des, Dr. Desalin, is uh, ac- accountability and justice for the Amara genocide that over the past 30 years that has been committed by the TPLF, the Roma Liberation Front, Ro- Roma Liberation Army, and including the Abbey administration and his prosperity party. And that includes the Amara regional uh, government leaders. Um, also to address uh, the um, the tens of thousands of Amara political prisoners who are now languishing in jail. Um, you know, since mid-May, you know, tens of thousands of Amaras have been rounded up in, in jail. These are, you know, uh, journalists, you know, university professors, students, fanos, you know, anyone who's critical of the Abbey regime. Um, another important, um, you know, uh, issue that Amaras would like to address is the constitution which has resulted in really in millions of Amaras becoming stateless in their own country. Um, and so, you know, within the Amara region, um, there, there's a crackdown against, um, you know, Amaras who, you know, critical of the Abbey regime. But outside of the uh, Amara region, these Amaras are stateless. They have no political voice. Uh, impossible for them, illegal, to even organize themselves uh, and under a, a civic institution. And this is an issue that we want to address. Um, and so these are really, you know, at least four important things that Amaras would bring to the table and would want addressed in any negotiation. And, and, and if these things are, uh, and if Amaras uh, are not, you know, can continue to be excluded, we, we can't really expect Amaras to accept any outcome of any, you know, conversation or discussion between the TPLF and the Abu regime as credible, legitimate, and, and binding. It will not be accepted. So I'll stop there. Um, Rovel, if I may just expand a bit on what Ted said. And I think the point, the overall point is in in the eyes of the Amaras, the current delegation that's trying to negotiate with TPLF is not acceptable, partly because uh, from the very beginning, Prosperity Party has alleged messy issue and it was not you know, select, elected uh, through democratic process. And I think we have people uh, such as Dr. Desailing that can expand on that, how the last round of election was rigged and, and there was pressure for people not to vote for opposition parties, uh, mainly in AMA. Um, but more importantly, as Ted said, you know, since the war started and even before the Oromo Prosperity Party led by Abiy, uh, is on a mission to build an Oromo hegemony uh, in the country. And Amaras are fighting back. And as a result of that, you know, thousands of people that were calling out Abe or criticizing anyone uh, in the administration have been, have been jailed, have been jailed for, for years now. So there's a continuing repression against Amaras who challenge Abe's administration, Abe's regime. And therefore, from the very beginning, there's like Abe as a as a prime minister and the prosperity party has has no alleged messy. But also I think there are particularly particular reasons that are tied up with the war. One, the agenda TPLF want to negotiate. They have always brought up the issue of Walkite and 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 Raya and they always put them as a as a precondition. If we go back to 2016, 2017, these are areas Samaras uh, were shouting. I remember when I was in Gondar back then, you know, being used, being killed, shouting, you know, for Walkaid, for Raya, for Amaras in other areas. And uh, TPLF would like to negotiate on these areas, 
with no representation of Amaras. And that's not logical. That would not be, obviously, as has been said, acceptable for Amaras. And of course, uh, Amaras are also fighting because TPLA brought a war to, to their uh, to their doors uh, in Amara region. Uh, and therefore, there are a number of you know accountability questions, uh, such as you know what happened since the war erupted, but also even before that. So the point is, yes, Tim Abi is not legitimate, and his messengers framed as you know delegation delegation members because at the end of the day, their loyalty is to Abi. As as Dr. Dasaling alluded, they're not nominated, they're not accepted by the uh, the uh, the party, the broader party structure, let alone the parliament. And they are just Abiy's messengers. So they are ultimately they are, you know, delivering messages to Abiy from and uh, to Abiy. And I think they will not be, you know, I, I, one can argue they are not even properly elected within the party structure, even if the the negotiation affair remained prosperity party affair versus TPLF. But more broadly, for Amaras, they are not they are not acceptable uh, messengers or negotiators. But the agendas are. TPLF want to negotiate are primarily Amara. The issue of accountability, the issue of you know territorial questions and identity questions on Wolkait and Raya, these are not these are not issue for for Abiy as an individual or for the Oromo Prosperity Party, which is dominant in the Ethiopian government. In fact, they uh, have they have a view that can be taken as you know more pro TPLF uh, on these matters because. The, you know, the, there are concerns they have in relation to, you know, representation of Amaras in Oromi as well. So accepting this delegation and letting them, you know, decide on this important matters that Amaras have been fighting for decades is a non-starter for Amaras. So I think that's why we keep saying the negotiation from Amaras' point of view has already failed. It's nothing we will look into because we are not there while our agendas are are discussed, and this is something that happened to us in the past. We will never happen. Uh, let it happen again. And I think, given the where the movement is, uh, you know, after several decades of you know uh, sticking to you know trying to mobilize around the, the Ethiopian identity, Amaras are now at, this, at that point where they can organize and and kind of pursue their interest. And that's why I think it's a mis- it's a unfortunate that uh, those external actors invested in. Uh, peace in Ethiopia uh, failed to recognize and really invite Amaras on the board. Even even as I mentioned, uh, 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 Abiy is not willing because there are reasons, as I mentioned, Abiy may not be interested in having Amaras properly represented because that, uh, that uh, goes against his interest to satisfy radical Oromos. And uh, generally, he doesn't want uh, anyone to have any role. He wants his messengers to finish a business and try to achieve some objective that he thinks will serve his interest. But for Amaras, I think it's larger than that. And I, I think it's it's really in the interest of anyone invested in the peace to recognize uh, the, the attempt of TPLF to negotiate on Amara issues with the Oromo Prosperity Party in the absence of Amaras and the, how that will not be acceptable uh, by many people, uh, and 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 I, I just want to reiterate that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hona. Uh, very uh, some very insightful points. Uh, next to uh, Dr. Fitzum, if there's any uh, just uh, brief thoughts you'd like to give, uh, just overall on the discussion. If if not, we can we can proceed to other uh, to other speakers as well. Okay, um, so uh, I, I see that we have a few people who want to join the stage, uh, and so we're going to try and accept um, uh, some of the requests. Uh, unfortunately, if we if we're not able to get to you, um, uh, please forgive us. There's uh, only so much time uh, we can allot to to, to speakers. But um, uh, Lak, uh, you've been on the stage for quite some time. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to say, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Robin, uh, for giving me a chance to say a couple of words here. First of all, uh, I'm Laika. Uh, I'm the current chair of the Amara Professionals Union. I'm also affiliated with GPE at the working level. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists today for really uh, 
bringing forth the, the important elements that affects uh, us. So uh, just a few points to make. Uh, maybe these are things that may have not been mentioned, but I want to really bring them uh, forth here so that people bear in mind. And also I would like the panelists maybe to say uh, a couple of things on the second, the, the final item I'm going to mention. First of all, what I want to say is the uh, when we when we uh, look at these events that are happening, I think all the the speakers said very very well. I I wanted to our audience to to uh, take in consideration the statements that are given by different entities, whether it's the TPLF, uh, the generals on the ground whether it is the head of state of the central government or the prime minister, all of this, the statements that they're making needs to be uh, needs to be weighed in light of what's happening. So uh, Amaras definitely don't have a representative in this negotiation. This is well stated. But beyond that, even uh, in regards to, uh, I want to start first of all with the TPLF. Uh, the, the spokesperson, the official spokesperson, Mr. Getacho Reda, has you know, explicitly put it out forth that they are about to settle score in the Amhara region. And we have seen the level of destruction that took place last year, that took place also this year. As we are speaking here, debating genocide is taking place. Nobody is talking about that. Not the report that came out yesterday. Nobody's talking about that except dedicated people who are talking about this. And where are they right now? They are in jail. Who has arrested them? It's the central government, the federal government that has arrested them. So I'm going to walk you step by step there. Uh, next, I move to the statement of the Oromia region, the president. Uh, uh, Abdisa or Shimalis Abdisa. Look at all the statements he's been, he been making you know, all the time. Next, you go to the prime minister's statement in all the, the time that he's making, not even recognizing the genocide that's happening in Oromia. You go on and on. And so they are making the statements on public media, on, on wherever you could see it's there. And to expect from such a group that actually there will be a fair representation, it's, it's mind boggling, especially for international partners, whether it's the European uh, Commission or United States. I'm gonna write to my state representative here that we don't have any representation. So uh, even for the people who carry the Ethiopian flag and go and protest in Washington, D.C., you cannot even carry that flag in Addis Ababa. People are being you know, killed. They have been in jail. So this is a fact. So let's not kill you know, each other. I think the fact is there. The government does not really uh, represent the Amhara people. That's a fact. And then when I, when I go to the level of destruction that have been caused in the Amhara region, I, I would like to see that being as part of the intentional genocide that's been wished out on Amara people. Education, health facilities, even in this last round of uh, invasion that the TPLF did. There's so many schools destroyed. And nobody, nobody is addressing these issues. So I, I, I really want us to come back again and have even a, a broader discussion and involve all those people who think actually there is a, a government there. No, what, what we're seeing here is a father to son kind of negotiation, okay? For 30 years, for 27 years, it was a TPLF. Now it's the OLF, the OLA. The, the, this is the negotiation that's happening. And then... All the outside elements are intentionally excluding the Amhara segment of the population. The war is intentionally prolonged. Intentionally it's prolonged. So we're not getting into any better situation. So I, I, I want to summarize it here. I, I really uh, thank the, the, our team here that, that really had this excellent discussion. They have 
uh, address it exhaustively. I think on the next level, what we have to do is bring out the public statements made by all the officials today representing whether it's TPLF or central government and show with their own, in their own words, what actually they're up to. So thank you, Robel, for giving me an opportunity. Again, I, I, I'm sorry for taking more time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Laga, for a very um, uh, clear and concise uh, message. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we thank you for uh, your involvement in, in, in the Amhara organizations. Um, next, um, I, I see that we are joined now on the stage by uh, Mr. Solomon. Uh, Mr. Solomon, uh, I saw your message um, uh, re requesting to speak about the, uh, the Commission's report. Uh, so I'd like to give you a, a chance to, to speak about that. If you can please start by uh, introducing yourself, um, your, what you do, uh, and, and uh, we can go from there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Solomon, if you're, if you're trying to speak, uh, please uh, unmute your mic. Right now, your your mic is muted, so uh, we cannot hear you. Okay. Oh, my, my name is Solomon. Thank you for this, giving me this opportunity. And my name is Solomon. Uh, I'm attorney at law and expert on the, the law of war. Uh, I work for the uh, ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, as legal advisor for the law of war. And I provide training on the law of war for, for the federal ministries, the parliament, the students of universities, and uh, lecture at law. Then currently I'm working as attorney at law and I'm representing uh, the journalists who are, who are detained in, currently in, in Ethiopia. And now I just follow your... Uh, your <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just following all the speakers and um, I really enjoyed it well, but I have uh, some doubt. I just read the rep uh, report that the commission just uh, set out today and I, I just really focused on the uh, atrocity, uh, atrocities uh, that was made on Amhara in southwest Ethiopia, especially in Urlega. And uh, in the report, I just highlight that the report said that, or the report mentioned that, uh, there was uh, an atrocity in southwest Ethiopia uh, based on the uh, hate speech and uh, dehumanizing some ethnic group without mentioning that the Amara, that it's, it's already known that atrocities were made on Amara's ethnicity. Then the commission simply says that it, uh, the atroc atrocities are only made for ethnicity, then without mentioning specifically the Amara. Therefore, uh, this 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 type of mentioning or this type of styling is also uh, made by the government. The government is mentioned simply that there was uh, atrocities uh, on some ethnic groups without mentioning the Amara. Therefore. From my point of view, from my point of view, the uh, <clears throat> the report is only just simply the uh, set out to uh, just to exemplify the acts of the government rather than uh, the act committed on the ground. And the other issue on your report or on your uh, or your discussion is about simply sustaining uh, uh, sustaining uh, peace and accountability. What about the redress? Re redressing is another issue, another, another issue uh, spe specifically for the Amara ethnic, because uh, as 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 we have as you have mentioned that not only atrocity but also the uh, Amara the uh, Amara people. It, or the Amara ethnicity also also uh, are currently without without any any uh... Uh, hi Solomon uh, I think uh, your audio cut off for me um, is it is it just me or are others not able to hear him as well 
No, we can't hear. Okay. Uh, Solomon, uh, if, if you're speaking, uh, please um, try uh, uh, maybe leaving the stage and coming back, and we'll give you a chance to continue. Uh, you, you are making some very excellent points. It's just we cannot hear you right now. Uh, I, I suspect it could be a, a connection issue. Um, so I'm, I'm going to move you to the audience, um, Solomon, and please try to request again, and hopefully this resolves the issue. Next, uh, I see that um, we're joined by uh, Biniam. Uh, Biniam, uh, if there's anything you want to say, please uh, unmute your mic and go ahead. Please start by introducing yourself and uh, the uh, your affiliations. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Ravel. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, my name is uh, Biniam. Um, but yo, I currently a medical student. So, um, I help host the Margaret Media in addition to uh, I also help at the evidence and documentation with uh, genocide prevention in Ethiopia. Uh, I just wanted to kind of just show my gratitude for all the uh, panelists for hosting um, this, um, you know, conference to be able to really understand um, why we need a sustainable peace and accountability for the many atrocities that we see in Ethiopia. Um, many of the uh, speakers have revealed uh, most of the topics that I, w I won't go in detail. I'm still kind of reading the, the reports that was made by the International Human Rights Commission. Uh, but I just wanted to state some of the kind of known facts to what's happening to Amharas and, and, and Oromia. I think that's a, a huge concern for all of us because, um, you know, as all of you know, um, in Amhara region, um, since Abiy um, Abi Ahmed came to power, we've seen an, an assassination to the Amhara regional president, Tambacho. Uh, we've seen a change from, uh, I think previously it was Temeskin and then uh, Agenyo to uh, now Yilikal. We've seen uh, so many changes within the Amhara regional president leadership, um, as well as the even the special force, the Amhara special force commanders have, have been recycled constantly. Um, and this just goes to show you um, that the ruling uh, party, previously the TPLF, now the Oromo dominated prosperity party, does not want a sense of stability uh, and uh, like directiveness in the Amhara region. Um, and so this is a, a huge concern um, when you have a, a constant change of, of, of leadership within uh, one region, you, you have no uh, kind of sustainability and to be able to carry on the legacy of the previous um, uh, administrator. Um, but if you go to Oromia region, um, we've seen countless um, genocidal campaigns and massacres in Horogruzun, but uh, forget a change of leadership of Shemel Sabrisa. He's been showing us uh, videos of, of tractors and farmland uh, and livestock, as that's the problem that we are asking on his Twitter page. Uh, that's a complete mockery uh, of, of, the, of the victims that are being uh, that are being perished in, in Oromia. And for those that are a pro abi or pro-prosperity camp, this, is, this should be a complete insult to that you support a party that makes a mockery uh, of, pe of people that live in this region. If I'm the president of, the, of a specific uh, region, I have the, res the full responsibility on my shoulder to protect and defend every person in that region, regardless of his race, ethnicity, um, Whatever other social uh, you know markers that you you want to you want to uh, ca categorize that person with, but the fact that he's still in power, Bashir al in, in the Oromia region, it goes to show you how deep in structure that the Oromo prosperity is in dominating and controlling Ethiopia, and so we not, we are not only fighting uh, uh, TPLF's uh, thirty plus year. 
uh, ethnic apartheid system that is uh, a structural based that Dr. Samnayat and Dr. Fusum already have discussed. We are fighting another looming tyrannical government led by the Oromo um, dominance in Ethiopia. Right? Um, we've seen it in Addis Ababa, we see it in uh, many Amharas now are, are even being uh, prevented from entry to Addis Ababa, from, uh, from Bahar Dar to go to Addis Ababa. Most people are, are turning into fl- um, uh, airplanes or flights because they are afraid for their lives what, what will happen if they take the uh, bus routes. And so this is a, this is a huge structural um, problem that if we keep ignoring it and, and, and just idolizing uh, uh, Abi uh, government and his ideologues, it will, it will turn uh, Ethiopia into a balkanized nation before we know it. So I urge everyone to to take a, a really closer look into what's happening to Ethiopia, and and hold people that commit heinous um, genocidal campaigns accountable for their actions. Okay. So uh, by the way, I, I hold the same standard of those Amara, um, uh, yeah, Amara prosperity leaders. The fact that they are sitting back while TPLF invades Kobo. Uh, for the, the third round and watches uh, while they are in their campaign to dislodge and, and demobilize Amara Fano members, uh, to me, they are our enemy as well. And we have to uh, use the same uh, ruling stick to be able to judge them for their for their actions and hold them accountable. Um, but I urge you to, to continue uh, to be an advocate uh, for your people. Keep keep fighting. Um, eventually, we, we, we will win. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Binyam, uh, for raising some uh, previously um, uh, uh, n- non-mentioned uh, points, some very important points, really, the, the, the federal government's um, uh, deliberate effort to destabilize the Amhara region and ensure it's destabled. Um, I'm told now that we have um, a special guest who would like to speak. Uh, however, I don't see him in the audience, so maybe... Uh, to, to this individual, if you could please uh, send a request to speak, uh, we'll give you an opportunity. Uh, and, and if not, then it's okay. Uh, just ensure that you're um, signed into your uh, Twitter account uh, so that you may appear. Uh, thank you. In the meantime, um, I invite my uh, co-panelists, uh, if there's anything that you wanted to add uh, on what was said already, uh, please take this opportunity and go ahead. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Hana. Oh, oh, okay. I, I, I just want to expand on the topic uh, Salomon brought up earlier. I think that was an important uh, point about, you know, redress and we're talking about like sustainable peace and accountability. And yeah, definitely there has to be a mechanism to you know, address the injustice Amaras and other people have suffered over the last uh, uh, three decades. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's one of the things, the good things about uh, um, the commission, the ICHREE, because it talks about transitional justice. And as I mentioned, transitional justice has uh, an element, multiple elements, as one of them being, you know, um, laying out what happened and who are the perpetrators and all that. But also beyond that, I think, to ask why this happened and what are the structural elements and how can we move beyond uh, uh, these uh, structures to avoid that, you know, the similar kind of atrocities um, not happen in the future. But as part of that justice process, there's also, you know, accountability and compensation for the victims. And this is something, you know, for particularly in areas that were annexed from TPLF, such as Raya and Walkite. You know, these people were displaced in mass from these areas as, uh, as TPLF tried to basically, you know, um, homogenize the Tigray region. A uh, similar process in Romia region. Uh, I mean, there are millions of people um, that have been displaced throughout the past, the past three decades uh, who are Amaras and um, were sent to Mara region. They were told, like, go back to your country, as if uh, Romania is not is not part of Ethiopia. And I think 
because of that, they have lost not only family members, they've lost their wealth, they've lost their, uh, their uh, you know, dignity and all that. So, um, so I guess we need to anchor as part of the transitional justice process a mechanism to compensate victims. Um, and I think that that point of like redress or mechanism to compensate victims, I think, is an important point that Salomon brought up, and it should be seen as part of accountability uh, for sustainable peace. Thank you, uh, Hona. Um, Dr. Sennight, was there something that you wanted to say as well? Um, actually, very similar and on point. Uh, I was going to reflect on um, the point Salomon brought forward. Uh, um, um, Hona addressed it, but on top of uh, Hona's address, what I would like to add is that we can already see how uh, he made a very good point. Um, the way the ethnic uh, attacks, the ethnic-based attacks, um, the genocide against Amaras, all the genocidal acts, in, starting from uh, profiling, classifying, a denial of service, and finally up to massacres, um, they are never, uh, you know, appropriately and uh, precisely mentioned in terms of who the victims are when it comes to governmental reports. And you see that carried over by other international uh, committees or groups that uh, document on this atrocities. So in part, it shows some implicit, implicit bias, but also in part, it shows that uh, not being enough represented in the government means that the Human Rights Commission, the local media, especially state-owned, all the bigger medias are state-owned medias. All these are used either directly or indirectly as an input for this uh, external, uh, you know, bodies that try to investigate this, um, this event. So you can see that not being represented at home means it carries all this problem in terms of reports abroad as well, especially if they're not given direct access and if they didn't independently and physically come in and investigate, they are bound to, to take information from generally what, you know, floats around on, um, you know, the social media and other, other information. So uh, basically, this is also a reflection of not at all being represented at home. You can see it carried over, being reflected on such reports where they don't even mention um, the, the, the actual ethnic group that be, that's been uh, massacred and murdered, murdered just for their identity. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sen Knight, uh, uh, for that important point. Um, uh, Hona, if there is something that you want to say, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, no, actually, I forgot to uh, unmute uh, mute myself. I don't have anything to say at this point. Okay, excellent. So uh, we're joined by um, uh, Ms. Zara Lema. Ms. Zara, if there is anything that you wanted to say, uh, please uh, go ahead. Um, hi, thank you, Robert. Um, hi, Hone. Um Thank you for the for the for the space and the wonderful conversation. I've been listening to many of you. Um, I just wanted to ask one question um, related to the topic itself: roadmap for sustainable peace and accountability in Ethiopia. Uh, it has always been bothering me. Uh, the, the, the absence of it has always been bothering me. And so I'm, I want to ask you this. What are the possibilities of um, the Amahara Association in America creating a space of conversation um, with you know, cross-sectional conversation with other national groups by way of creating that you know, insulated space out of the body politic of the Ethiopian political space today. Uh, I think we all agree that uh, given the report from the, the UN human, human rights uh, experts today, um, it's safe to say that Ethiopia has transformed itself uh, as a place where an end-to-end -end active crime scene, regardless of who you are and um, what your national background is in, in all this. What are the possibilities of creating that space for conversation 
out of the political space and the role of uh, associations like the Amhara Association in America, um, say like creating that space with, you know, Romo Studies Association or Global Society of Tigrayan uh, Academicians. Uh, I, I wonder if I named the name correctly, the letter one. Is there a possibility? Is it something that you consider a way out of addressing? Because to me, without having a consensus on the crimes that are being committed in Ethiopia today, end to end, as I said, it will be very difficult to ensure that peace and accountability uh, is in order in Ethiopia. So do you consider this as a possibility, creating that cross-sectional national group conversation out of the political space that is arguably dominated by the Oromo Prosperity Party today? If we take it outside of that, do we have a chance of creating that space where, you know, uh, really impactful conversation can happen like this one. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the question, uh, Salala. Um, I'd like to give an opportunity for either Ted or Hona uh, to respond. I'll, uh, I'll defer to Hona first. I mean, um, they were colleagues, and so, and then I'll, I'll, I'll chime in if I, if I feel I need to. Go ahead, Hone. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi, Zanala. Nice to hear from you. Um, I think you raised an important point, and this is something we've been trying to send a message. And I think when we talk about like the issue of representation and inclusive dialogue, inclusive negotiation, um, I think we have to take uh, a principle that we have to accept the fact that at the end of the day, you know, Ethiopia is a country for Ethiopians and it's up to us primarily to really try to resolve the issues that are dividing us and, and uh, address fundamental issues. Yes, uh, you know, policymakers uh, from uh, around the world it has an important role to support that process. But I think at AAA, and we believe that, you know, ultimately it's Ethiopians that have to decide on the fate of uh, Ethiopia. It's Ethiopians that have to decide on what kind of Ethiopia we want to build moving forward. And I think we are in this situation where now, because that opportunity was denied by TPLF in 1991, there was an opportunity to really start fresh, have a really genuine representation of different groups, and forge a consensus about the country we want to, to, to build uh, moving forward. That didn't happen. That was a missed opportunity. Another missed opportunity happened uh, when, you know, Abi came to power. I think we Ethiopians have to realize that, you know, instead of pushing for accountability and sustainable solutions, we jumped into something that was not really, uh, you know, uh, uh, yield, yield that was not really set up to really change the country fundamentally as, as required. And there were a lot of celebratory messages coming from you know Western media outlets and others for Abi, but at Tripoli website, no, like there were um, fundamental issues that uh, uh, the country was dealing with in the past uh, three decades when TPLF was in power, and just the changing of um, you know individuals would not would not make this problem go away. We need to address the fundamental roots fundamental issues the country is, you know, dealing with, and that being, you know, lack of representation, uh, lack of, you know, respect for human rights, and, um, you know, the, the overtly, you know, competition along ethnic lines, and and how that further divide us, um, enabled by a system that recognizes ethnic homelanders as, as homogeneous, uh, group as well. In reality, none of Ethiopian regions are, are homogeneous. So we need to go back and start this conversation as Ethiopians to, to, to really ask the fundamental question, what kind of country we want and what's our vision for that country and how we can achieve that. But to have that, I think we need to, we need to create a space, enabling a space. The first obstacle, I think, is 
is refusal to to listen or to begin fresh, even though there is, you know, ample evidence suggesting that the constitutional system that the country has now has failed the country. There's always this constant request from other groups saying like, you know, oh, the constitution cannot be touched. Uh, it's, a, it's a refusal to negotiate. It's a refusal to ask questions and generate answers. It's a refusal to basically include other communities and take opportunity uh, created by this, you know, ethnic apartheid system and build the hegemony. And I think we need to push those groups that are saying like, you know, the constitution cannot be changed to ask themselves, no one will benefit if the country continues like this. And this is not sustainable for anyone. And this will not be helpful. It might help a few elites that are building wealth and power at the expense of more, many Ethiopians. But at the end of the day, I think the country will not be uh, what we want it to be if we continue the same route we, done, we have done in the past. 30 years. So the conversation needs to happen and the first obstacle that f for that conversation to start is the refusal by certain groups to, to really not uh, touch the constitution. Because for many people, not just Amara said, as we said, many Ethiopians despise the current constitutional system because it divides us. And because it's not, it's building, you know, a system that benefits a few elites at the expense of ordinary Ethiopians. And that should be recognized and there's a need to have that openness, to have a dialogue about the constitutional system. Second, I think we cannot have this conversation in a very hostile environment, you know. Right now, uh, there are recurrent massacres, genocidal massacres against the Amaras in the region. And until that continues, the priority for Amaras will be, you know, saving themselves. And you cannot have this fundamental questions uh, or a discussion about these fundamental questions. Well, your safety, your um, kind of survival is questioned on a daily basis. The Amaras in Oromia are taking gamble on their lives, even by staying in Oromia at this point. And the Oromia regional government refusal to even recognize that there are Amaras being killed and uh, to continue to talk about prosperity uh, as, as has been quickly as, as can be seen by you know, the media engagement and the social media posters by Oromo, uh, Oromo Prosperity Party leaders is an obstacle. I think we need, we need uh, uh, recognition of the ongoing pains in different parts of the country and uh, pose them. Uh, and, and that requires, I think, governmental entities such as you know, Oromo Special Forces and others undertaking their responsibility to protect citizens. That will give us, you know, a breathing space for Amaras and others to really ask, okay, now what, how can I reconcile with other groups? What's the, the, the solution and all that? I think we need that to happen for the conversation to, to kind of be started. And so there is a need to reduce, you know, rhetorical and hate speech. And so down here, I want to share uh, our experience at AAA because there were attempts to have conversation across ethnic lines. Some of them, rather many of them initiated by external actors. An example was there was a process by uh, UNPO, I think, and represent, the, the UNPO is a civic association primarily based in, in Europe and working with European Union policymakers. And there was an attempt to bring different communities uh, together to try to resolve, a, you know, a better pass for Ethiopia uh, as uh, uh, some, some, I think a year ago or so. And at AAA, we were very happy and we jumped on that opportunity, but we had to, we had to excuse ourselves from that process because everywhere we go, we find it a very uh, hostile environment. They will talk about it, like as the comments will say, Amara elites want to build uh, uh, one nation or uh, they, they want to impose a feudalist system. I mean, you recognize that that's, that's really, really inaccurate and disinformation at this point. And there was a lot of head, head speech targeted more broadly at Amaras and particularly at AAA team as, as we engage in that process. And we thought there has to be a, a, a kind of a principle of 
like not abusing these processes to uh, to to uh, reproduce and amplify hate speech. And I think that is not that's counterproductive and will not be comfortable for people to participate in. So yeah, I think the short answer is yes. At Tripoli, we are always advocating for that, and we have an experience of trying that. But uh, our experience tells us that for that for that kind of this conversation to go anywhere meaningful, there is a need to uh, stop ongoing uh, atrocities against Hamas uh, throughout Ethiopia. And there's a Amaras need a prison space to think and even engage in that in that conversation. And we are now being denied that opportunity. And second, there is a need to start that conversation from from uh, from you know really a clean start rather than you know engaging in in uh, uh, supporting uh, you know systems that have failed us. Uh, I'll stop there. Uh, uh, Robert, if I can just um, chime in here, because um, Sadala brought up a good point, and, and I'm not going to repeat what um, Hone has said, but, um, y- you know, there, the, as an organization and, a, and, a, and as a people, um, I think we have always been open to having this open dialogue on everything, um, on all the issues in Ethiopia, uh, because we you know, at, at our core, uh, at the heart, as Amaras, um, we are, um, uh, we, you know, we are, we are not na- Ethiopian nationalists as well. It's not uh, so. Uh, in, in order for you know Ethiopia to continue uh, as a strong state, that conversation, that discussion across all ethnic lines, uh, need to have uh, need to happen. Um, you know, so interestingly, uh, until Abiy Ahmed, um, you know, was selected as as prime minister. Triple A had um, was in regular communication discussion and had um, uh, you know uh, joint projects uh, uh, you know pre you know um, you know pre Abbey with other Ethiopian groups. In, in fact, we had even released joint statements. Triple uh, A was a member of an uh, of a coalition called the Ethiopian Coalition, which included um, you know um, uh, Somali diaspora groups. Oromo diaspora, uh, diaspora groups, where we discuss Ethiopian issues, where we also collaborated on legislation that could be introduced within uh, that can be introduced in the um, uh, that, that was being introduced actually in the United States Congress, uh, in the House, and the Senate. Uh, you know, we were able to negotiate around the 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 text, and no legislation was introduced until we were all satisfied. So. We have proven as an organization and also in collaboration with other um, advocacy groups and interest groups here in the United States. And I'm talking about Ethiopian diaspora groups um, uh, f- uh, as well as human rights organizations that we're working with like Amnesty and Human Rights Watch that we can successfully maneuver and, and, um, and negotiate uh, and, and discuss these contested issues and, uh, and, and, and agree uh, on you know, US legislation that can be brought forward. And House Resolution 128 is an example of that. You know, that's a, that was, you know, it, AAA contributed a lot to, to the introduction and passage of House Resolution 128, but that was in collaboration with other Ethiopian groups, including, you know, um, you know Ethiopian groups from, uh, that represented the Oromo community, as well as the, um, uh, the Somali community. So, and as civic organizations, we are, you know, we, we do have a unique position in that because we are not seeking, um, you know, power for, you know, our, organiza- our organization, our, you know, our individual selves. And being here in the diaspora, we are in a unique position where we can have that conversation. But um, we have proven in the past that, we, you know, we are willing to take that step forward and have that conversation. We can have that conversation so, um, uh, so long as the environment is amenable to that. We have to remove the attacks. We have to remove the hate speech. When Hone was mentioning the UNPO, I represented AAA um, in, in those discussions. And there was a lot of hate speech hur- hurled at me and also Amaras by you know different groups. And it got to the point where as an organization, we had to remove ourselves because it was not, you know, it, it was not productive. But the you know, so long as there are you know, good willing people, good willing organizations, and they do have represent, you know, represent a decent number of their communities. Um, and, uh, and they're open to have that conversation. Um, you know, AAA and the Amhara community here 
has always been open to have that conversation. And we have had those conversations. So um, I'll, I'll stop there because I don't want to repeat anything else that Honey has said. Okay. Uh, so, Sarala, uh, I hope uh, you got an adequate response from uh, Hona and Tedros. Um, hi, Robert. Yes, uh, I got a adequate response, but uh, it tells me that uh, it, it's a doable thing. I think we need to put our thoughts together. Just, just imagine the possibilities of that. Uh, regardless of the differences, you know, there, there, there has to be a beginning somewhere. Um, without a beginning, there is not going to be any progress, of course. So for that beginning, we need to have in our imagination that it could be possible. Uh, it could start with a very simple coming together, uh, that, that creating that, uh, you know, cross-sectional national conversation uh, outside of that, that, that political space. I insist on that one. So um, it tells me, it warms my heart to hear Tedros and Hone responding to that. And it, it gives me the hope that it is a possibility if we put our thoughts together. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, and, and, and Sadala, if, um, if, if you can DM us or reach out to us via email, I'll, we can, we'll be more than happy to send you examples of where actually, um, you know, AAA was able to make this happen. And um, you know some of the joint statements that we have released in the past, um, and other collaboration efforts. So it is doable. It can be done. And when we ask for the Amara community to be included in the negotiation process, which is a political process, which is much more you know uh, arduous and difficult uh, you know process. So we believe that a conversation amongst the civil community, the civil society, which is you know much more concerned about having. Um, you know, to, you know, ensuring that issues of um, you know human rights um, and accountability are addressed, um, and and it's not about power. That's something even you know much easier to do, right? That's not a, a big of a hurdle uh, than let's say a political process. So uh, please reach out to us, and we would be more than happy to have that conversation and, and you know present examples. Okay. Uh, so thank you uh, for the excellent back and forth. Uh, I'm told uh, our special guest from earlier is still around and uh, is hoping to speak. So I encourage them to send a request if they're able to. Uh, if not, uh, we can continue as we've been going. Um, we have some new speakers on the stage, uh, including uh, Habtamu. Habtamu, if there's anything uh, you'd like to contribute, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you, Robel, and uh, the entire uh, AAA and uh, GP team for organizing this space. I just uh, would like to add some points, especially to the policymakers of the United States and uh, other Western powers, uh, to, uh, to just say some uh, statements, because as uh, the war drags on in Ethiopia, and the exclusion of uh, Amharas from the political process in Ethiopia is uh, continued. It, uh, Amharas have been uh, are being pushed into resentment, where the very uh, existence of uh, the Ethiopian state is becoming questionable. Amharas have been always supporters of the unity, territorial integrity, and the continuity of Ethiopians. But as we continue, as we live under uh, uh, almost an apartheid regime where we are uh, killed at will uh, by terrorists like OLA, uh, OLF and TPLF, and as the federal government becomes complicit in the crimes against the, the Amhara people, the Amhara youth especially, which uh, uh, is about 60% uh, of the total population of the Amhara people, uh, is being pushed towards resentment where we, we, we don't see any hope for the, f uh, the future of Amaras in uh, the, uh, Ethiopia. So uh, by ignoring, uh, I just want to say this one, by ignoring the plight of Amaras, uh, the United States and other Western powers are putting uh, uh, their national security interests at risk 
as the country is being pushed towards the brink of uh, disintegration due to the apartheid system and hegemonic uh, policies which the Oromo Prosperity Party is trying to enforce in the country. Actually, uh, these Oromo Prosperity Party policies uh, are uh, uh, implicitly and explicitly supported by organizations which as Adala earlier mentioned, like uh, the Oromo Studies Association, which uh, acts as a think tank and writes white papers uh, how to ensure the absolute supremacy of Oromos for the years to come. And this is a very dangerous uh, path the country is going into. And uh, I am afraid as an Amhara and as uh, uh, a person who loves Ethiopia, I am afraid uh, the very existence of Ethiopia is as, at stake unless immediate intervention, correct intervention, not political intervention, uh, which has alter, uh, ulterior motive uh, behind it, but correct intervention is put in place by United States and other Western powers, which are trying to, uh, to do their best in order to bring sustainable peace uh, in Ethiopia. And after saying this, uh, I am not a member of AAA and um, I don't have any right to speak about AAA, but I just want to comment about the question which Adala asked it, herself being the edi uh, editor-in-chief of one of the hardline Oromo uh, news medias. Uh, we know what kind of narrative uh, herself, her media and Oromo Studies Association pushes especially Oromo Studies Association. We know the hatred it has about the people called Amhara, what kind of papers have been published, what vision they have for Ethiopia, and how they look Ethiopia. Amharas have never said Ethiopia is a colonial country, a colonial power. But Oromo Studies Association defines Ethiopia as a colonial power which colonized a country called Oromia which never existed in history. And uh, the problem definition of Amharas and the problem definition of Oromo Studies Association and other Oromo fundamentalist organizations, including Addis Standard, which Sadala uh, chairs as uh, editor-in-chief, is absolutely different. So to work together, uh, even if theoretically it is possible, while Oromo Studies Association depicts Amharas as their eternal enemies, while Tigrayan uh, uh, Scholars Association uh, uh, specifically uh, calls Amharas their enemies, to ask us to work with these groups is uh, more than hypocrisy. And we know and we can cite so many uh, publishings which have been put put out by Addis Standard, uh, which uh, uh, the lady whom I mentioned uh, uh, chairs as editor in chief. Therefore, uh, Amharas. Now we have we have with or without uh, without others, we have taken control of our agency. We know we have been carrying the burden of preserving the nation state Ethiopia while bleeding, while dying, and while taking all the problems, the historic problems, which uh, might have happened or may not have happened. But now it's over. We cannot carry the burden of preserving Ethiopia forever. And we want to decide our fate by ourselves. And we believe we are capable to do that. So uh, that's all I want to say. Thank you very much. And I, I appreciate if uh, my leaders, whom I respect a lot, Hone, Teddy, uh, Rob, and all others, Dr. Sanait and others, please try to tell, uh, to call a spade a spade. I know you are trying to be political. You have so much responsibility. I am a private citizen, but I know you have a burden of carrying a lot of responsibilities uh, as you represent organizations. But the problem we don't work with these organizations. Is they think that we are their problem. Amharas are the problems of Oromos, according to the Oromo Studies Association. Amharas are the problems and eternal enemies of uh, Tigrayans, according to the Tigrayan Academic Association. And for, a, for me to go and work with this person 
who enjoys my killing for me to work with uh, uh, this person who uh, pushes a narrative that has put Amhara genocide uh, uh, legal, uh, quote unquote legal in Ethiopia uh, to ask me such a question is hypocritical. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, th thank you, uh, Habtamu, uh, for uh, uh, sharing uh, your views and some very important concerns, which I think uh, other, the vast majority of our uh, community actually shares. Um, next, uh, I see that Solomon, you've returned. Solomon, if you're able to speak, I know that uh, there was a connection issue earlier, but if you can continue, Solomon, uh, please uh, unmute your mic and uh, uh, you can continue where you left off. Thank you. Uh, Solomon, if you're able to speak, please uh, unmute your mic and uh, you may continue where you left off uh, from before. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the inconvenience because of the light and, and next to the connection. Uh, I just uh, I have some question. Uh, one of my questions is about the title. Uh, the title for your discussion is about uh, sustainability and accountability. But the most important issue is about not only accountability, but also uh, rigorous, uh, rigorous for the victims also another big issue. Because uh, in spite of, uh, or in spite of the atrocity made by uh, such uh, TPLF groups, but but also uh, most of the property of the Amara people also uh, damaged by uh, totally the, in some part of uh, Amara region, especially in Gondar, you know, and also in uh, Tauzolo and the North Shore, almost all properties, including their. Uh, Life, uh, including their animals, is also uh, damaged, totally destructive. Then, how do you how do you address or how do you think about the redress issue about the compensation? Accountability is, is nothing, but the most important issue is about redress. You have to you have to address. You have to question and you have to uh, discuss about the redress rather than accountability. Accountability another issue. Accountability without redress is nothing. But for me, redress is very important because our people is is, is without their uh, animals, without their house, and is without, without their property. They are they are living in the in the field. The, their home is on the field. Their home is without animals. Their their home is without uh, crops and etc. Therefore. What do you think about redress? For me, redress is the second and the most important point we have to we have to we have to erase the issue. Then what do you think about this redress? And my another question is about the scope of the report. The scope of the commission report. It is simply just uh, exposing the loop or the gap or the the crime committed by the government against the Tigray people rather than the crime or any other indirect genocide, indirect atrocity made by the government against the Amara. Then how do you see about the significance of the, the report in favor of the Amara? This is my two questions and uh, I just went to some point from this question saying thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Solomon. Um, you asked some important questions. Um, I, I realized that uh, there was a communication issue in between. So I think there was, um, you, you may have missed some of the discussion because uh, a lot of these points were actually um, addressed. Uh, however, I don't know, Hona or Ted, if you guys want to touch on anything again, Although this space is recorded, so anybody who missed uh, any parts of the segment can actually go back and 
uh, listen uh, to the beginning. Um, so to, if, if anyone wants to contribute, please go ahead. Otherwise, we can move on to the next speaker and then we can wrap up. My, 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 my view is that, um, you know, uh, Solomon, I, I, I know that you're calling from Ethiopia and, and I'm sorry that you were disconnected, but um, I invite you to listen to the recording because the question of redress was addressed by Hone and then also the scope of the report uh, and then also the lack of really um, uh, 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 of a broad investigation and, um, and re reporting by the ICHREE as it relates to atrocities committed against Amaras by the various actors was not um, uh, was not properly addressed. That's also was addressed in, uh, by uh, b by the uh, by the panelists by uh, uh, Dr. Fussum, Dr. Sennight, and uh, as well as Robel and Hone. So please listen to the recording. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Ted. Um, next, uh, we have Itayal. Uh, Itayal, uh, if you can, if you have anything to share, please unmute your mic, and uh, you may go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity, Robel, and uh, thank you, AAA, for organizing this. Um, it's a very important topic. Uh, sustainable peace and accountability in Ethiopia uh, uh, is uh, uh, the very core of the problem uh, that we need to discuss at this time. And uh, the the word, especially sustainable, is uh, what what's very important here. Because what we are seeing, uh, groups forming alliance uh, these days is uh, tactical. And that tactical and alliance uh, of TPLF and uh, OLA based on uh, a path to power uh, is not sustainable. And it's, uh, uh, we know how that culminates. We have an example. We have history. Uh, that shows us uh, that's not far away from uh, 35 years. Uh, we know how the tactical alliance of TPLF and EPLF, Eritrean People Liberation Front, how that ended. It ended in war. Uh, so when they get to the gates of the power, uh, they start disk people uh, uh, the, that form the tactical alliance for the sake of just getting rid of what they uh, draw a narrative of a uh, kind of common enemy for the sake of the path to power, which was Amhara at the time. And when they get to Addis Ababa, you know, they turn the guns against each other. So who who ripped that uh, uh, disaster? The Ethiopian people, the whole uh, instability and a burden of, to East Africa and also the to the rest of the world as well, to some extent. And we are seeing that coming now. We're seeing into our own eyes uh, the the Oromo Liberation Front, who, according to their narrative, who, who they say that they represent the number one, the largest population in Ethiopia, uh, and the Tigrayan Liberation Front, who they say they represented uh, only six, seven million people. Uh, so by the very nature of the large and the, the small size of uh, the constituents that they uh, claim to represent, they're going to end up in conflict if, if they succeed even overthrowing this government. That's, that should be scary I, even to any Western country uh, uh, that is, that is uh, 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 that, uh, like U.S., whose interest should be uh, and commitment, that, as we know, is peace and stability and sustainable peace and stability and security in the Horn of Africa. This is disastrous and scary, and, and it's coming. And uh, so um, the uh, OLA, uh, assuming that, okay, we are number one in population, the current, uh, the current ethnic federal system uh, benefits us. And... Uh, so for what then what should be then what should be uh, uh, of uh, interest for TPLF to make such an alliance that means they must have not uh, wanting or planning to stay in Ethiopia uh, so if I don't I, 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 I don't really uh, um, uh, claim uh, to represent the interest of the people uh, if what I care is 
if that results in peace. If Tigray liberates peacefully, fine. If Oromoya liberates peacefully, fine. But do we even have a clear natural borders that 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 that, that, that are not begging for more conflict? We don't have. The people are intermixed. Ethiopia has over 82 ethnic uh, groups. So all these uh, uh, plans and tactical alliance are, we know that they are going to bring a disastrous uh, situation, and we are seeing it, and we are seeing it in Oromia. Amaras are being killed as we speak right now uh, uh, in uh, Ilubabor, West Walega, every day with the cooperation of the current ruling administration. So, uh, uh, Anyone listening to uh, this conversation, especially uh, uh, if the U.S. officials have a chance, uh, we beg you to see it from this perspective as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Itayel, uh, for a very uh, uh, eloquently delivered uh, speech. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, next, uh, I'd like to give an opportunity for Mastawal. Uh, Mastawal, uh, if you can speak, uh, uh, please. Okay. Just Thank real you. quick, um, uh, and ask for the people uh, coming forward is if you can please um, share your comments or, or your, um, if you have a question to ask your questions in, in under two minutes because uh, we have to begin wrapping up. We're, we've been online since one o'clock. So um, thank you for joining us and being with us, but we have to start wrapping up pretty soon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, first of all, for organizing uh, this uh, discussion. Um, I want to raise uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the, uh, the first one is, could we really uh, have sustainable peace in Ethiopia with the existing system, uh, that's the political system, as well as the existing politicians? That's uh, the first thing we need to talk about. I don't think we're going to have sustainable peace with this uh, existing system. The first uh, uh, reason why, uh, because, you know, this ethnic politics always creates uh, a super ethnic and an a superior and inferior ethnic uh, group. That's natural to the system. Whenever you are in power, you would be superior uh, because you would control the government, uh, the economic system, and then you can benefit your own ethnic group. That was evident during uh, TPLF's uh, hegemonic time. That's evident uh, in today's uh, OPDO-led uh, Ethiopia. So could we have that kind of, uh, could we have sustainable peace? I don't think so. So the first thing is we need to uh, think about that one. The other thing is Ethiopia's political system is historically based on an individual. Like if you see the history of the country back in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, and today, it always um, rises and falls with an individual. When a king goes, most probably there is a conflict, the worst there is war. Imagine if Abi Ahmed for some reason goes today, the problem in Ethiopia would be even much worse. I mean, I'm not his supporter. People know, uh, just like at least some of you here know that I'm critical of him. I, I'm, and uh, he is one of the main reasons that Ethiopia is in the current situation and it was predictable. And many people um, didn't see that coming, but few people. So I'm not saying that um, I uh, foresaw that. Yes, I was saying that he would be a problem. So, uh, unless Ethiopia's political system is based on uh, rules, regulations, system, and institutions, we couldn't have sustainable peace. For the time being, we could have uh, for a short period, but um, just not uh, for a very long time. The uh, other thing is uh, with the existing, the existing negotiation itself. Let me come to that point. Prosperity Party and TPLF couldn't negotiate and bring a lasting peace. Why? Because both of know each other very well, very well. Uh, like um, PP officials, including Abi Ahmed, as I said, they are graduates of TPLF's School of Triatory Taught. They are trained in that school, they know. So then the TPLF know Abi 
and his party could be deceptive. Abi and uh, his officials know TPLF could be deceptive. So we couldn't have, I mean, just like with the existing, with the existing system, with the existing uh, politicians, we couldn't have a sustainable peace. So we have to think about in terms of uh, these, these things. Uh, I, I mean, uh, you asked us to make it shorter. Uh, with respect to Amhara, I want to say uh, some to uh, uh, three points and then I would finish. Uh, Amharas in this conflict, why the Amharas are an afterthought by uh, the international institutions like the UN human rights, uh, by domestic political actors. We have to ask why, why the Amharas? Is it not because the Amharas uh, aren't massacred enough? Is it not because they aren't victims? No, the Amharas are victims of this war as Tigrans or Afars, and even worse, they are victims in peace, relatively peaceful areas in the south, in the west, like Matakal and Wolaga. Why they are, they are, the Amaras are, are not, uh, I mean, the, the crimes committed on Amaras are not uh, raised by those institutions. Because Amaras are not domestically uh, represented in the political system. The uh, Amhara National Democratic Movement, which is currently Prosperity Party, prosper, uh, in Prosperity, Amhara Prosperity, those people never, ever want to protect the people they uh, claim to represent. They are, even to the worst, they are the first to attack. And whenever the TPLF wants to attack or the OPDO wants to attack, the Amhara people, they are like uh, the, the, the first to, to, to uh, attack, to organize, to spy, to, uh, to do all uh, those uh, heinous crimes. So they, they, they are the enemies of Amhara. We, we need to understand those Damakamakunin or Agenyote Shagar or Yilkal, they are protecting their interests. The Amhara people need to understand that. They are their enemies. Um, another thing is, the uh, Amhara people, the Amhara people, are forced to choose between uh, two evils: the TPLF or the OPDO, the Oromo Prosperity Party. But there was no any movement to emerge as a force by itself. That kind of thinking needs to emerge, whether we like it or not. Ethiopia, as a country, may disintegrate from this war. There is high probability. You may not like it. Many of the people, uh, when I say this. But there is high probability. So we need to think about that. This ANDM, that's um, ANDM sidekickism, couldn't bring, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't take us anywhere. We need to think about it. If Ethiopia continues as one country, Amharas would be represented and they would take their own fair share. If Ethiopia disintegrates, at least there, there would be some ethnic homeland for the Amhara. I'm sorry to say this, but that's the current reality we are now. Uh, but with the current mentality that we can be with OPDO, we can follow this, we can do this, and then we can sustain. No, that's, that, that, that doesn't take us uh, anywhere. Uh, I wish uh, Ethiopia sustains uh, um, from this war and emerged as a new, uh, better country. But that may not be uh, the case. I mean, we need to think about it. What if Ethiopia ends up Yugoslavia? Many people said Yugoslavia and Ethiopia are different. But the ethnic political system destroyed both, uh, both countries and also there is there there is high probability of uh, that one happening and also if you see currently people are not freely moving from Amhara region to Addis Ababa uh, the, the roads are closed every day uh, and also people are killed every day so is it does Ethiopia really exist does Ethiopia really exist and also the situation in Tigray if it's not solved in Amhara in Afar if the war continues what's going to happen we need to ask ourselves uh, those kind of questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Master Wal, uh, for a uh, uh, very uh, detailed and in-depth analysis. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, Ted, did you want to say anything? No, j just um, uh, one request as we are um, about to wrap up. Um, again, please be cognizant of the time. If you can um, keep your comments in under two minutes. Uh, if you can avoid repeating. And then also, if you can um, also maybe suggest, um, uh, uh, you know, suggest recommendations in terms of like how we as a community, as Amaras can move forward. I think we have identified a lot of the problems. Um, uh, so 
you know, how do we, you know, move forward to address the, um, the topic at hand? That, that would really be helpful. And one of the questions, um, one of the requests for the panelists, um, you know, as we, you know, go into like our closing remarks, again, the request is, you know, please, you know, think about recommendations for the Amhara community here in the diaspora and also in Ethiopia. What should we be doing to, um, you know, to ensure that there's, that Amhara is represented in any negotiation process, if that ever, you know, materializes. But in addition to that, um, you know, how do we ensure accountability and redress? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ted. Uh, so just with being cognizant of what Ted just mentioned, uh, I see a couple more speakers. Uh, to those of you who are requesting, uh, we will not have enough time to get to your points. So apologies, um, but I'm just going to give the opportunity next to Amorau and then Muduso. So Amorau, if you can speak, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Robel. Thank you so much, Ted, uh, Hona, Sanayik, and everybody else. Uh, I just want to add a couple of points on um, the economic side of this, uh, the, the cost, the economic cost to the Amhara community when, when we are discussing about this war. Um, so even before this war, the Amhara's economy was as, as it's, you know, at its worst shape, right? The Amhara's were like, the Amhara region uh, hosts like 20, uh, 26.1% of the population living below the nationally defined, the nationally defined poverty line. This is according to the statistics from the 2019 Demographic and Health Survey. That's a standard survey carried out by USAID. So the Amara region has 26.1% 20, of the poorest people in Ethiopia, while the national average was just 23.5%. And if you see the healthcare, co the healthcare coverage, and if you see any other standard indicators uh, of the sustainable development goals, the millennium development goals, or whatever indicators, health care, road coverage, education, the Amhara region has been failing behind compared to other uh, regions in Ethiopia. And that was not by accident. Or that was not because the Amhara region uh, uh, has, you know, these um, unproductive citizens. That's not the reason. That, the reason is because that was supported by government policy. There is a visible discrimination in budgeting and allocation of resources at the federal level. So the, this physical federalism, with the way they allocate the budgets, is, is purposely flowed to favor a certain part of the country and hurt others, particularly the Amharas. And we have been uh, discussing about this the whole day almost, why the Amharas have been blamed for everything that went wrong in Ethiopia pre-1991. So, so this war uh, has added you know, sold to the wounds, right? Because because this war has been technically happening on the Hamara region for, for the most part, three times now. So what does that mean? The productive uh, citizens, they were fighting the, the front lines where 84% of the Amara community survives on agriculture. And because the war was happening during the rainy season, we were not able to produce enough to feed ourselves. So when we are talking about justice, in addition to the human rights abuse and everything else, I think the economic justice has to be also considered as part of anything that's going to be done after this. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Amora, uh, for touching on uh, a very important point, uh, the economic uh, marginalization and the really the, the deliberate nature of it uh, and uh, really another symptom of the ethnic apartheid system under this uh, ethnic federalism system. Um, next, uh, I'd like to give an opportunity to Muluso. Muluso, uh, if you're able to speak, uh, please unmute your mic and uh, go okay. ahead. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me, Robert? Yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, AAA and um, everyone else who is involved for, for this program. Um, I just wanted to make a comment real quick. Um, there is a say in Ethiopia, uh, when you hide your illness or your sickness, um, your corpse will show up. Uh, what that means is that um, when you hide uh, something that is real and when you try to ignore it, uh, the worst will show up and the worst will come. Um, the reason that we see all the atrocities against Amharas and all the uh, disaster that is happening in general in Ethiopia, um, there were so many players 
there were so many participants in the beginning of the constitution, which we believe as an Amhara, and I personally do believe that the source of all the problem is the ethnic-based constitution. This constitution was not just established by two or three groups or individuals. This constitution had so many players, inside and outside players. And if we are, um, if we look back and see what happened in Ethiopia in the last 30 years, the, manar- the marginalization of Amharas, the atrocities, the genocide um, against Amharas, and all the disintegration of the, the, the Ethiopian, you know, and the whole um, spirit of Ethiopianism is this, this ethnic-based, um, uh, you know, constitution. And this constitution is kind of like almost banned in the, the rest of the world, but, but it was allowed to, to be um, used in Ethiopia. So to me, um, if we are truly, um, truly trying to bring um, sustainability and peace and reconciliation and whatnot in Ethiopia, we have to dismantle this constitution. And when we say that, and all the, um, the, the, the players inside and outside, and the so-called the guardian of the, the nations you know, around the, the world, the United Nations, um, and other humanitarian institutions, when they ignore the daylight genocide um, you know, committed against the Amharas, um, and denying the true nature of the genocide, and denying um, our cries, and um, actually, in a way that um, you know, just uh, feels like they're pouring, um, you know, um, more appeal to it uh, by um, you know um, leg- legitimizing the, uh, the the ones who are committing the, the the genocide. That is never is going to bring peace to Ethiopia or to you know in the, in that land, because it will be just a matter of time. You know, um, the, the Amharas are not where they are now. Uh, uh, you know, like 30 years ago or 25 years ago, or even five years ago. The Amharas are organizing. We are speaking up. We are um, bringing our issues uh, to the world. So if, if we, as a, as, a, as a world, you know, um, to, to, you know, thinking and looking into and uh, actually care about human lives, and, um, you know, with the, the, the other countries, including the U.S., um, with so much interest in the Horn of Africa um, and uh, care about the stability and the safety of the Horn and that area, it really requires all of us um, to be part of this uh, process, part of the healing process, um, and part of the, you know, like the peacemaking and making things, um, you know, better for the betterment of the people in Ethiopia and also in general for the Horn of Africa. So when I look at uh, bringing, um, you know, sustainable peace and accountability in Ethiopia, I call everyone, the, you know, the, the Ethiopians and also the United Nations, the U.S. and all the Westerns who are turning their face the other way when it comes to the true atrocity that is happening in the genocide happening in Ethiopia. So unless all issues are addressed properly, um, you know, there will not be that uh, peace that we all are looking for. And that's what I call for everyone who is uh, listening or, um, you know, wanting to get something, uh, you know, from my comment is that it it will take all of us um, and we want the international community to give the attention that the, the Amharas and in general the Ethiopia needs at this critical time uh, where everything is um, just under fire. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Muluso, uh, for a very um, uh, powerful and, and strong message. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, so at this point, we will no longer be taking any uh, more requests uh, or questions or statements. Uh, we're going to move to our closing remarks. Uh, thank you to all of you who joined us for this very uh, long session, this roadmap for sustainable peace and accountability in Ethiopia. Uh, and I see uh, at the beginning, we were joined by Dr. Fitzum, who is no longer with us. So instead, um, I'm going to give closing remarks to the original speakers. And then maybe um, in place of Dr. Fitzum, maybe Lata, if you would like to do that, uh, I'd give the opportunity. So everyone please make it very brief 
uh, two minutes. We'll time you uh, and go ahead, starting from Ted. Uh, am I going first, uh, Robil? Uh, t- sorry, Ted, I, I assumed you wanted to go first when you unmuted your mic. Would oh, you like no, someone no, else to go no. ahead? Uh, why don't we just, you know, I, I think I've said, um, we'll, let's, let's give Sen Knight uh, the uh, first and, and then go, go, go that way. Sure. Yeah. Sen Knight, uh, if you'd like to uh, uh, give your closing remarks, uh, please uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I might not get another chance, so I'd like to commend you on the great um, job you did uh, managing the space. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, just to quickly, um, briefly summarize, uh, for I first want to pass my message to all Ethiopians. Um, currently, Amaras uh, are undergoing immense pain, suffering. On top of that suffering, the denial, uh, the blaming the victim, and all that, if you really think about it, it would it would almost, we're not talking about a 200, 400 years um, story. We're not talking about a thousand um, of years story. This is something that we're looking uh, in our own eyes, in videos, often recorded as souvenir by the killers themselves. It's not even an evidence uh, that, you know, victims, survivors um, who are recording in a, in a you know, a, a hidden, because often this, um, um, the services are usually interrupted before this happens. And this doesn't only happen, I know we've heard a lot about what happened in Weleka and Natekel in the relatively peaceful areas where war is not like conventional war recognized internationally is not happening. But even within, you know, uh, where the war is happening, uh, it is extremely underreported when, um, you know, when atrocities happen, war crime, genocide, everything all in one. Uh, happen to Amaras as opposed to, uh, and also uh, within the war uh, context to Afaris as opposed to, you know, when in the mainstream media reports it as a, a war in Tigray and also, um, you know, generally how it's framed. And this really hurts, uh, not just really technically because it's wrong, but also it really kills that fraternity, it really kills that um, sense of uh, belonging. So if we're talking about sustainable peace and accountability, and as Salomon mentioned earlier, and Hone uh, touched upon it as well, and also really justice and, and, and you know, translational and um, trans, um, uh, transnational justice, uh, it is really important to recognize first that uh, to be aware this pain is happening. And beyond really experiencing this in real time right now, it will leave a huge blemish on, um, you know, on, on our nation, uh, on, on our generation. And, and how we handled it will come back and haunt us because right now it's not mainstream, but when it becomes later a mainstream uh, topic, because that's how genocides usually tend to be, it's something that will really blemish us. Just let's look at what are we comparing when we compare about, uh, you know, whenever the genocide is brought up, we're comparing really um, topics that are not even relatable, are not even, cannot be even parallelized in terms of, you know, the pain of looking at a baby that's being slaughtered from the back of his neck. You know, it's, it's, I, I will stop here. I just want, uh, in terms of the, the, the local Ethiopians in general, and even like people around us in the Horn of Africa, really, it will leave a blemish on on um, on our history and our consciousness. That's what I want to say. Uh, but um, generally, just uh, the, the the last thing I want also want to say is that um, like we let's be mindful in our conversation uh, going forward. Really, uh, what are we really looking at? Are we talk? Are we uh, speaking based on evidence? Uh, are we really communicating disinformation? Because that has a huge uh, inputs into part of the, the problem as well. And I really fully want to second what uh, Muriye said in terms of the, you know, the, 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 the uh, con- you know, the connotation to other actors, uh, international, US, Europe, UN, um, you know, African countries, the AU itself, really, when they interpret the situation, how important it is to put um, ethnic Amaras, uh, Afaris, and also other groups that are directly in, uh, affected when we talk about, um, you know, the national dialogue and on the road towards uh, a better Ethiopia. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sen Knight, uh, uh, for the wonderful concluding remarks. Uh, next, uh, I invite uh, Laka, if you would like to give a very brief uh, concluding remarks, just two minutes. 
Uh, please sure. go ahead. Sure, sure, Robert. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent discussion. Uh, I, I see this uh, this today's forum as uh, the beginning of the way forward. So what does it look like? What does a way forward look like? I think to me, a way forward will have in it components of accountability, account of uh, a real representation of the people who are disfranchised. It requires justice, compensation, based on factual data. This, these are to me the elements of the way forward. Anything outside this that's going to be done just as trying to sweep the rug, I don't think it's going to cut it. In fact, it's going to be even worsening the situation. Excellent discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Laka, for very brief uh, concluding remarks, but very effective. Uh, next, I invite uh, Hona uh, to give your uh, concluding remarks. Please go ahead. Thank you, everyone, for joining um, and sharing your perspectives. Um, I really, I think it was a learning experience for some of us as well. I think as a conclusion, I think let's not forget that peace cannot be achieved by excluding prime stakeholders in the in the ongoing war in northern Ethiopia and that's Amaras. I think um, it, it shouldn't be the job of Amaras to ask this. It's in everyone's interest, all Ethiopians, uh, Abro, Western powers and others, anyone invested in peace in Ethiopia should um, ask for inclusion, inclusion of Amaras and other stakeholders to bring sustainable peace in the region. We also uh, should remember that, you know, we have missed opportunities for effective accountability as a part of transitional justice uh, in the last three decades. As I mentioned, there, were, um, op there was an opportunity to really uh, keep uh, uh, accountable the, the APR deaf leaders in 2016, 2017, uh, but we, we collectively, I think we didn't pursue that path and here we are. And I think uh, accountability is the only way we can move uh, we can move forward, and regardless of uh, you know how that that looks like, we all should agree that they should be accountable for all this you know atrocious crimes committed against Amaras and others over the last uh, three decades, and therefore it's a it's an, a choice that Ethiopian Samaras and uh, all uh, all people invested in Ethiopia that have to make. We need to anchor accountability as a core principle in anything we do moving forward. For Amaras, this is a, a difficult period, I understand, and all of, many of them, many of us have, uh, you know, families that are killed or displaced and, uh, uh, from different areas. That's a story for many of uh, AAA members. And uh, this is a difficult period, but also I, w I invite you to think this uh, moment as an opportunity to shape the future Ethiopia, because uh, for a long time, we were absent in the conversation. It's for the first time that we're speaking for ourselves and we're presenting our demands. Other groups, at least the major ones, have done that and not only made sure their interests are known, they also imposed their interest on the rest of uh, Ethiopians. For Amaras, it's the first time I think we have uh, become a formidable force not to ignore and we're going to dictate what Ethiopia looks like, not because we want to uh, dictated, but it's just simply because we are the miss we were the voices that have been missed around, and we are coming and speaking for ourselves. And so, future Ethiopia has to has to address the interest of Amaras, or else it cannot be a viable state, or cannot continue with that. So there is uh, an opportunity and a responsibility uh, that we have to recognize that you know the the interest of Amara, the interest of other groups have been known and addressed. It's the Amaras that have been missing, and our, our work will shape what the future Ethiopia will look like. And we have been very generous in advocating for an inclusive, an inclusive Ethiopia because we believe that's the way forward for everyone to, 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 to have a thriving life in this in this country. But also at the same time, others should also realize that this is a critical moment that you cannot continue to impose anything on Amaras and rule the country or impose your interest um, as, as, as was the case in the past. And therefore, it's a, a reckoning moment for, for Amaras and for, for Azaras as well. 
and uh, I invite anyone who can contribute to contribute to the Amara movement in a, on a daily basis and uh, to get in touch with Triple to amplify our work together and support each other. Thank you for joining us tonight or this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Hona. Uh, a very uh, important message and uh, touching on some very critical points. Uh, next, I'll provide my closing remarks and then uh, we'll finish with Ted's closing remarks. Uh, so it was a pleasure to hold this space with uh, this distinguished um, uh, panel of guests and speakers. Thank you for everyone who contributed. I encourage everyone to follow the speakers, uh, to follow up with what they're saying on their own profiles. Um, you can follow AAA's updates on, on Twitter by uh, following the, the AAA account. Uh, this recording will be made available. It's being recorded. Uh, so in the future, you might share this with people who have missed, who have missed uh, the session. But otherwise, I think in closing, really what we need to do as Amharas is continue to organize, continue to stand with principles, and continue to tell the truth because unfortunately, we're living in a reality where uh, the truth will not uncover itself. Uh, we need to tell our own stories. We need to tell our perspective. We need to share that and ensure that uh, the Amhara perspective is, is not excluded from uh, any future conversations when it comes to the fate of Ethiopia, when it comes to sustainable peace, because uh, from the start of this war and from uh, the years before, the Amhara uh, made very, very uh, great sacrifices to realizing uh, equality and, and democratic freedoms in Ethiopia. And unfortunately, uh, the hope that the new government brought, the, the hope that was with uh, Prime Minister Abiy has now been shattered. Uh, and now uh, Amharas are in dismay as uh, basically... The, the new, the, uh, the EPRDF that was led by TPLF has been recreated and the Tigrayan hegemony and the apartheid and the genocide has been uh, replaced with Oromo hegemony and apartheid and genocide. So we stand with the victims of the genocide. We, uh, we continue to call for an end to the Amhara genocide and we, we call upon all those who are interested, who are uh, intrigued to continue to support uh, organizations like uh, AAA, like uh, GPE that are doing the work to document the genocide and to advocate for the victims. And we call upon the international community to listen to the Amhara voice uh, because this is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's not just a matter of two actors as what was mentioned earlier in this conversation. Uh, the, the situation is much more complex, but, but unfortunately it's not what, it's not how it seems or it's not how it's portrayed by, uh, you know, the, the mainstream sometimes. The Amhara are really uh, a people that have been caught in a, in a war that they had no choice in. They were invaded, they were then jailed and arrested, and they were invaded uh, again and again. So uh, we're now in the midst of the third round of genocidal invasion by the TPLF. Uh, in some areas, unfortunately, civilians are not being receiving any protection to the point where it, it's almost felt as if, uh, you know, their deaths and the atrocities against them are being exploited for some type of, you know, uh, scorecard for strategic political purposes. And it's very unfortunate. And uh, we, we encourage everyone to, to really just, you know, make any future accountability or reporting measures based on the victims, based on the people, uh, not to give a platform to the, those who deny the genocide or deny the atrocities and uh, to, to ensure that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, one of the greatest uh, groups uh, numbers wise, actually arguably the largest, most populous, uh, is, is paid attention to in the Ethiopian context and is uh, given uh, a proportional representation and a proportional voice. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. And I'll just turn it over to Ted. Rob Bell, thank you very much. Um, to all of you there who've joined us, I really want to thank you for, you know, uh, uh, you know, taking really essentially a half day out of your time to be part of this conversation and, and contributing and um, and to uh, Robel, um, Hone, um, Daike, uh, Dr. Sennai, and uh, Dr. Fusum, you know, thank you for you know uh, you know being part of this panel uh, um, as a panelist and and uh, sharing your thoughts on this important topic and um, and you know I know this is a very difficult time for all of us as Hone was saying and there's many of you probably that have that are directly impacted by what's happening in Ethiopia many of you might have lost family members. Um, you know, homes destroyed. Um, we have a member that lost 12 people, 12 of his family members in Walega. And this was the person that I had speak, I had to speak to directly. 
This was the person that we had arranged a meeting with his congressional representatives and his senator uh, so he can tell his story, his pain, uh, in front of his son. And, um, well, you know, we had to sit there and witness that and, and watch him cry and, you know, and, um, and, and share his pain to his congressional representatives so they can understand the, the pain he, his wife, his children, and his whole family were going through. Um, but, you know, knowing all of this, and, um, you know, and, and, and I know for a lot of my team members, um, you know, it's challenging because we get these reports from Ethiopia, from our team in Ethiopia. We read them, we edit them, we publish them, and it's not easy. It's very difficult. But one thing I can tell you as the AAA team, um, we, we are optimistic about the future of Amaras. And the reason being is because for the first time, we are taking uh, ownership. We are taking agency for our future. When many of us joined this Amara movement in 2015, early 2016, um, there were hardly any Amara organizations. It was very, very difficult to organize as Amaras. Um, it was a taboo to organize as Amaras. It was a taboo to say, I am an Amara. One of the reasons, one of the impetus for establishing AAA and, and the, one of the goals of AAA was to end this taboo of organizing as Amaras. Why did AAA establish itself early on in the movement and similar other organizations? Because we saw the threat coming. Because we didn't see, our, our people see the threat. They didn't see the danger. And at that time, you know, I've told the story before, when I used to travel and speak at events, you know, um, you know, when Amaras would see me at the airport or in, uh, in hotels, they would, you know, tag, um, you know, you know, my, my arm and whisper in my ear and they would say, thank you. Th thank you for, you know, speaking about Amaras. They didn't have the confidence to speak up, you know, openly and say, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the work that AAA is doing. Thank you for advocating for Amaras. But right now where we are, it's a completely different uh, situation. We have Amara organizations being established all over the world. And we're working together, collaborating on a global scale meeting on a regular basis, making an impact within Ethiopia. So, um, so, so I, that's why I think that, you know, the, 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 the future for Amaras is bright because our people have awakened. Our people are now organizing. Our people now are, you know, uh, speaking for themselves for the first time in a very long time as Amaras, as proud Amaras and also as proud Ethiopians. For Amaras who live here in the United States, we are in the midst of a mid-year election right now. You have an opportunity to make a difference. You have an opportunity to elevate the issues of Amaras. You can call your congressional representative. You can call your, rep your senators. You can go visit the congressional uh, um, uh, offices and have that conversation, educate them, and, and, get, and have your voices heard. Right now, members of Congress, all House members, every one of them are up for election. So they're holding town halls. They're you know, holding campaign events. Go and be present, be active, and educate them about Amara issues and the issues Ethiopia is facing. Also, it's legal in the United States government, I mean, in the United States, actually, in the United States, to donate to campaigns. So if there is a member of Congress, a senator running for office, and he supports our cause, volunteer, donate to that campaign. It's your First Amendment right. On September 8th, AAA held a, a congressional virtual fly-in where we met with 10 members of Congress and we invited Amaro organizations um, you know, across the state who were constituents to participate uh, in those meetings. We were in the meeting from 10.30 a.m., until uh, 5.30 p.m. We took the whole day off. That's a way that you can make an impact. Similarly, if you live in Canada, Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, in any democratic country, you can do the same thing and elevate the issues of Amaras. Educate your neighbors. We, you know, we need to go beyond frustration. We need to go beyond complaining. We shouldn't be lazy. It is up to us to educate the world educate your, members about, uh, your neighbors about what's happening. 
if you're in an educational institution as a student, as a lecturer, you can hold events to educate the academic community. There's an avenue for you. There are platforms for you to do that. You can write op-eds on your local, regional, national, and international papers. Many of you here who are part of the Twitter space demographic are capable of doing this. So I am challenging you to do that. Lastly, support Amara organizations. It's why we are being heard for the first time. It's because we're organized. So, well, you know, we are engaged directly with the United with the with the United Nations through the ICHREE. AAA has held multiple rounds of meetings with the ICHREE because we're organized, engaging with the U.S. government. Ambassador Hammer was here today. Why was he here? Because we're organized, and because it is in his interest, it is it would, uh, to listen to the Amhara community. Um, you know, uh, we have been successful in introducing and passing legislation because we were organized. Appearance on Western media. Dr. DeSalen joined us today. It is because Amara's organized a political party and Amara sacrificed and died to elect people like Dr. DeSalen so that he can go before parliament and challenge those uh, people in power who are committing Amara genocide. This is what it means to be organized. So it's only through organizing that we can take agency of our own destiny. So the solution for Amaras is the responsibility of Amaras. Others can help and assist, but we have to lead as a unified, organized force. So if we want a better future for Amaras and Ethiopia, it's on us. It's up to us. Please support the Amara organizations. If you're, um, there are Amara organizations in, in, your, in, the, in your area, please join be active. There are many ways that you can contribute. If there's not an Amara organization there for you, for the things that you want to do, orga- establish it, organize it, and move forward. Thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. And, um, uh, you know, hope you have a good rest of the day. And, you know, please be assured that there is a bright future for Amaras. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Ted. Um... I think uh, someone wants to say something very, very quick. Um, uh, Sen Knight, I think you want to say something very quick. Thank you very much. I really didn't want to, uh, uh, that that ending, that message was amazing. It's just something that uh, was repeatedly brought us, uh, brought up to us to uh, GPE. So I just wanted to mention it before letting everyone uh, go. I, I wish uh, you could give me the chance before Ted spoke, but I'll make it very short because I want uh, his uh, concluding remark to to um, to be fresh in everyone's minds. So basically, um, I just really wanted to communicate the fact that uh, as GPE, uh, there are a lot of questions about reporting about uh, this maybe could be used in the future as another round of uh, you know, uh, cultivating, um, you know, revenge, etc. I just really wanted to uh, quickly let everyone know that we take extra care in terms of reporting how much uh, some of the, the population where this uh, crimes have happened, whenever we get information, for example, Oromos was protecting uh, targeted Amaras, uh, Gumu's uh, people protecting targeted Amaras, uh, similar in the South also uh, when it comes against Goragis, um, Gamos, and Amaras, and when the local population protects, we fully report that as much as possible. And um, I just want to um, explain to the crowd here and beyond who would listen in the future to the recording that our uh, our plan, our objective one in one only, to cut this human suffering short. And the flip side of genocide is fascism. And uh, fascists usually kill their own as well, if uh, they're not on board. So basically, the whole idea is, and if you look at uh, political programs in the past, organizing principles uh, of ethnic Amaras, whether in Ethiopian uh, context or uh, organized as Amaras, they never, ever, we've never, uh, 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 you know, organized uh, against anyone in principle. It is all about survival, uh, getting a fair share and not wanting to be killed, and returning the dignity. So uh, the dignity of our people, um, and, and also the dignity of our, our nation as one as well. So this would be a very, uh, I, in, in, uh, that's the same 
principle that GPU works with, and also we've been documenting on other atrocities whenever we can verify, whenever our early, uh, uh, early warning officers can verify, we do that too. And this carries on to also the, the, the topics that were brought up in terms of, you know, wanting to work together, not, you know, having echo chambers, uh, involving other ethnic groups, etc., in the conversation. We do, uh, the last sentence that I want to say is that we do realize that the current political representation for Amaras, uh, it didn't come by choice. It was all uh, imposed on us. So we will not assume that the others uh, also chose uh, who is in the power structure right now be it for the grand people, be, be it for Oromos, be it for all other ethnic groups. So we do realize, we know uh, the ADN, ADP, NDM, or the APP uh, at whatever section of its history line doesn't represent Amaras. So we cannot really impose it until we are given a real reassurance that the current institutions in Ethiopia actually also represent the other ethnic groups. So we, we're not that as, as, uh, assuming. So whoever has a, a, a good will for our people and not really organized, as Hatamu said earlier, as my colleagues from AAA said, in the principle of, around the principle of eradicating Amaras, is a welcome brother or sister to us. Um, so that's what I wanted to mention. Uh, but really, I, 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 I appreciate um, Teddy's uh, concluding remarks and second them as well. Thank you very much. And I thank all my colleagues from GPE for uh, really working this, uh, closely working with you and, and appearing at the, at the uh, platform as well. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sinnett, for the second set of uh, closing remarks. Uh, so someone from the audience uh, also wanted to say that, uh, you know, the, the issue of the jail journalists was something that was very, very uh, important for them. So they wanted to say to continue to advocate for the jail journalists, for the victims of the mass arrests, uh, and to continue to be an active member of the Twitter community, uh, including participating in these spaces and other initiatives. And with that, uh, I have nothing more to say. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, we can now close the space. Thank you.